Okay, okay. Uh, well, okay. Well, okay. Well, anyway, I'm not sorry. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I bet there was a PC thing. I was like, yeah, that's crazy. And I was like, yeah. Weird. I mean, I can't destroy my set of my set of All right, everyone here who's a speaker, could you raise your hand? Great, you all know who you are. Okay, so we're going to be using a lapel microphone, which is this microphone. And you can just put it right there and it'll work fine. And that's it. The other thing is, um, if you could stand in this area right here, that would be perfect. That way you can see your slides on the screen and you can advance them using the clicker. And the laser pointer works. So. Any questions from the speakers? Awesome, thank you guys. Big question. Will we be able to see the PowerPoint notes or the presenter mode? Um, unfortunately, no, because it's not allowing me to do screen um, duplication. It's only letting me mirror screen. Um, if we can figure it out in the next 10 minutes, maybe, but I doubt it. So if you want to have your own laptop open, you can advance the slides as you advance those slides. But um, yeah, I don't think I don't think we can do that right now. Yeah. We can still see like the slides in the Yeah, screen. you can see the slides, yeah. If anyone knows how to do that on Windows eleven, please speak up.
the one I'm the one I'm I'm a graduate student in chemistry, and uh, throughout the day, I'm sure you will uh, get to meet some of the other um, some of the other astrobiology fellows, which are sitting amongst you in the uh, light blue shirts. Um, so, our first talk of the day is by Tatiana Gibson. It's titled "Sedimentary Textures of Fluvial Conglomerates in Gale Crater Mars." And uh, just to let you guys know how the schedule is going to work, we'll have uh, four talks and then a break, and then we'll have another four talks and then a break, and then we'll have our first keynote, then we'll have a lunch break, which will be 30 minutes, and we'll be providing lunch. Then we'll have our uh, third session of four talks, another break, and then we'll have our uh, second keynote and our astrobiology certificate ceremony. And that schedule is available in the back and on the QR codes next to you. So, uh, all right. And if uh, at any point you need to leave or you want to send the, the stream link uh, to uh, friends or family, um, if you go to the Explorigens YouTube channel, it should be up uh, on there. All right. Tatiana. And it will be um, 15 minutes total per speaker. So uh, however much time is left in that 15 minutes, we'll use for questions. House volume. Awesome. All right, hi, I'm Tatiana Gibson. I'm a PhD candidate in the Earth and Atmospheric Science Department, and I'm advised by Dr. Francis Rivera Hernandez, who's our wonderful uh, Georgia Tech Astrobiology uh, Program co-director. Uh, this is my work in Gale Crater, which is the home of the Curiosity Rover. Um, so the Curiosity Rover is in Gale Crater on Mars, which it has been there since 2012, so it's 11 years and going strong. Um, and this is a really fascinating place on Mars that was selected for um, the location of a NASA mission due to it appearing to be an ancient Paleolithic basin, so a place on Mars where we can look at the past history of water based on the rocks there that were originally imaged from orbit. Gale was formed by an impact uh, 3.7 billion years ago, so quite old, um, and the sediments that we see in the middle, there's a lot of 
different layers of material that appear to have been deposited in the middle of the crater um, after the impact that initially formed it. So we have a history of reworking of what's inside the crater itself. Let me close that. Oh, someone might have. Oh, that's my bad. <laughs> Oh. Is there a way to dim the lights in the front a little bit? Yeah. Thank you. Did that work? Keep going. Okay. Um, so the primary science target of the Curiosity rover is Mount Sharp, which is that mound of sediments five kilometers high in the center of the crater. And even though this is an ancient lake basin, there are, of course, is evidence for uh, fluvial activity, which is another way of saying river activity, so past surface flows of water um, on Mars. And that's what I'm really interested in. The rover itself is equipped with a lot of instruments to investigate the ancient habitability of Gale Crater, um, both by looking at the chemistry and being able to image sedimentary rocks, which is really the, the science target here. So you can see um, an overview of a lot of the different instruments that are on board Curiosity, and I'll mostly be focusing on images that were taken uh, by the cameras in the visible and how we can capture sedimentary textures with those. Um, so excitingly, at the very beginning of its mission, um, before it even approached Mount Sharp, uh, Curiosity imaged fluvial conglomerates. Um, and conglomerates are sedimentary rocks that contain clasts that have diameters of two millimeters or larger. So these are relatively coarse-grained materials. Um, and the fact that they were rounded and imbricated, so they kind of stack like little um, dominoes almost, was indicative of textures that are typically associated with um, fluvial activity or river activity. Um, so we had the first in-situ evidence for flowing water on the surface of Mars by imaging these rocks like the one that you see there with that rounded pebble highlighted. That's about um, a few millimeters across. Yay, we have lights. <laughs> Um, by measuring the different grain sizes of grains within these conglomerates, um, we can actually reconstruct some of the paleo flow conditions in Gale Crater, which is exciting to have some constraints on what the water was actually behaving like in the past. Um, so by using those grain sizes and putting into um, this equation here that has D or the diameter of a grain in it, um, we can reconstruct paleo flow velocities of 0.2 to 0.57 or 0.75 meters per second to, to get some more insight into what this water actually looked like. Um, these conglomerates are thought to be associated with the Peace Ballast Fan, which is um, that yellow thing that I've highlighted here. Um, it's an area of sediment deposition that appears to have been um, constructed by flowing water, and you can even see uh, the incised channel of Peace Ballast itself that looks a lot like a river channel that you would see here on Earth. Uh, so I talked about roundness as being one of the key indicators of fluvial activity, and roundness is important because uh, when you think of a stone or a little pebble that's in a stream, um, that's indicative of abrasion by different clasts bumping into each other as they're traveling down a river. Um, so I'm using roundness as one of the metrics to distinguish um, what these fluvial conglomerates are. And there's a couple different ways that I measure that. Um, I, this is actually work that I presented a few times through explosions, um, so you might have seen this before. But when I'm talking about roundness, there's two different ways that I measured it. I can do that um, quantitatively by creating this index of the sharpest corner and the overall size of a clasp. It's a ratio of the two that varies from zero to one and gives you a rough sense for roundness in, that gives you a number. Or you can actually do it visually in a qualitative way by assigning things based on a visual comparison chart. So you can see that there's um, a very angular class on this side and well-rounded class here. And this is more robust against the effects of image resolution. We're working with a lot of different resolutions of images on Mars. And this is a little bit more consistent in terms of assessing how round something is when you're trying to compare two outcrops to each other and describe what they look like. Um, but so some of the more recent work I've been doing is looking at the sorting of conglomerates. Um, so sorting refers to just the, the overall range of grain sizes that you see within an individual rock. So you can actually see an example of what different um, sorting metrics look like. You can see well sorted, you have really good consistency with the size of all the grains that you would see in a rock versus something that's very poorly sorted. You see a much um, broader range of different grain sizes. And why this is important is because different depositional mechanisms, so if you were to compare um, set moving around in a dune field versus a river um, versus at the bottom of a lake, they're going to see different um, characteristic types of sorting there. So this is a, another way to constrain depositional mechanism, which is something that's really interesting to us in Gale Crater. Um, so some simple equations here that use statistics for grain size. Um, these are all different uh, percentiles, basically, of 
different grain sizes, and that gives you an actual number um, that you can assign to different rocks to indicate how sorted they are by tracing grains and images, because that's what we have on Mars, is images to actually look at how well sorted something is. So what we see is a couple different um, kind of end member types of sorting. Um, so this rock right here is a conglomerate that had a sorting value of 0.7 after doing some statistical analysis, I guess, of the different um, grain sizes here. And that's a moderately well-sorted conglomerate versus this one right here. You can see um, it has some really big class, like the one in the very middle, and then some finer stuff as well. Um, so that ends up being classified as poorly sorted. And you can also see that it appears to be pretty angular. So when we look at that comparison chart that I had before, um, this represents a kind of different end member of texture that we see in Go Crater, which might be indicative of different um, types of depositional mechanisms being prevalent in different areas in Go Crater. Um, so here's an example of just kind of, of the full range of diversity of um, different sorting values. Um, so the column that I'll highlight here is just the class of sorting. Um, I've given examples of different rocks. So this is a more well-sorted rock all the way to this end, which is a less well-sorted rock, um, very poorly sorted in this case. But there's really a diversity of textures, which is, again, indicative of different parameters that might be controlling what these rocks look like. Even though they all have similar sizes of clasts, um, they might look kind of similar. There are um, quantitative ways to um, assign different uh, values to them in terms of how their sorting is classified. Um, and I wanted to point out that D95, so 95% um, of clasts are smaller than this value within an image. Um, and this is really what is controlling a lot of these values in that equation that I showed before. A lot of the grades are unresolved in these images. So D5, like 5% and the 16% are unresolved is what that is showing for these. Um, so it's really these largest values that are um, reflecting those big differences in um, grade size in an image. Uh, so I wanted to highlight that last one that I had as the most um, poorly sorted conglomerate. And this is actually somewhere that is in a different location in Go Crater from um, the map I showed at the beginning, which is at the base of that piece of alluvial fan. This is instead a conglomerate that was deposited in the heterolithic units, which are basically just big piles of rocks um, that are out of place, so they're not necessarily um, located where they were deposited. Um, they've been reworked, so you have just kind of boulders scattered about, so you don't quite have the stratigraphic context. Um, but this appears to be a different place um, where rocks are sourced from in Gale Crater, maybe moving down from uh, Mount Sharp rather than the crater rim where that fan is. So this gives um, a different location for the source area and likely a different depositional mechanism. You can see that this is a very, poor, poor, very poorly sorted conglomerate. It has larger subangular clasts, so the texture is very different, and it's more consistent with what we would call a fluid <coughs> deposit rather than a fluvial deposit. Um, um, which is to say that there is probably going to be more rock in the water to rock ratio here. So we can start to get some constraints on the water availability in past Gale Crater when we try to look at these different depositional mechanisms, even though they were both um, moving down slope and had some amount of water and some amount of rock in them. Um, so for future work, I'm really interested in looking at the diversity of textures and how they map out spatially. So this is a preliminary map I have of some of the locations where um, these conglomerates actually occur in um, visible maps um, from HiRISE, which is an orbital camera that has 25 centimeter per pixel resolution um, in orbit around Mars, um, which is just a spectacular resolution. And you can actually start to resolve some of the conglomerate outcrops that we see from the rover in orbit as well. So you can see some lighter tone patches that is typically um, what conglomerates look like from orbit. So by mapping the spatial extent of these different textures, we can get a better sense of how prevalent certain ones are um, across scale crater to get a sense for whether maybe fluvial flows or um, more debris flows um, appear to be more common by extrapolating one texture to a broader location. Um, so in summary, these textural properties of conglomerates can be used to help interpret depositional history. There's a lot of rocks that um, seem really consistent with fluvial activity with those rounded clasts, and those larger clasts that had to be uh, mobilized by flowing water. And the degree of sorting can be another way to interpret um, the depositional mechanism here. And these different mechanisms are ultimately indicative of the relative abundance of water and gives us constraints on the habitability of ancient Gale Crater because we're ultimately interested in the water history billions of years ago and getting a sense for how much water was there. Thank you. All right, if anyone has any questions, I'll bring the microphone around. Yeah, I, I have seen a little bit of this before, but this is a really 
really great presentation. Um, I was wondering, so the, these rocks have presumably been exposed on the surface for quite a while. How does that change the interpretation, especially for this, for this first point, which is the roundness? Yeah, um, so th this is something that I'm really interested in right now, and I'm going to be doing field work in a couple months to look um, at alluvial fans here on Earth and seeing um, deposits that appear to be a lot younger versus ones that have been sitting on the surface and are older, and comparing the roundness between the two to get an actual sense for how roundness changes over time. Because on fan surfaces, especially in deserts, you have all these thermal effects um, and cracking from temperature differences in the desert day and night. So class can actually get more angular over time by sitting on the surface um, due to things like that. But I really want to get some constraints on the degree of which that happens and kind of the time scale at which we should be thinking about for um, post-depositional changes in the roundness of class. Very cool, thanks. Thank you, this was so fantastic to see. Um, my question was about the resolution of this sorting technique that you use. Is it sensitive to water density? Oh, um, yeah, I mean, so in the sense of like... Uh, if it's a, a brine, a concentrated brine oh. versus more fresh water, I know you might find you know, salt precipitates around, but maybe not, right? So I was curious about... Yeah, so I guess the, the thing that I, I would point to... I don't know if this will let me go back. No. Um, this equation that I included here, um, with critical shield stress, um, the density of a flow is accounted for in this equation. Um, so you have the different ability to mobilize sediments um, with different densities, so salt would change the density of a flow um, and have implications for the size of a grain that you would be able to mobilize. Um, I don't know if Francis is chiming in or... Oh no, I was just picking up the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I can't find it. Uh, no. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, I would assume that you would mobilize different grain sizes um, based on the density of the flow with included um, salts in it. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Let's thank Tatiana again. Thank you for bearing with us. Now we have Alviva uh, and Olivia. I'm so sorry. Olivia Ang, nice to meet you. Yes, nice to meet you. Presenting <laughs> 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 a mass cam multispectral investigation of rock variability in Yale Crater Mars. Implications for alteration in the clay sulfate transition of Mount Shark. Okay, that would be awesome. No worries. <laughs> yes, hi everybody. My name is Olivia Ng. Uh, thank you for that nice introduction. I'm a first year PhD student with uh, Francis Rivera Hernandez. Uh, but today I'm going to be talking to you about my master's research that I conducted at Western Washington University. So Tatiana gave a pretty nice introduction to uh, the rover's home, uh, Curiosity rover. Um, but specifically, I wanted to go into detail on why Gale Crater was selected for its astrobiologic potential. Um, so in the lower uh, slopes of Mount Sharp, there are uh, there's a phyllosilicate bearing unit overlain by a, a sulfate bearing unit, which is hypothesized to represent an environmental transition from one that was warm and wet to accommodate the formation of clay minerals or phyllosilicates to one that was cold and dry, which allowed the precipitation of sulfates. So this is my uh, study site of interest. Um, in panel B, you can see the uh, hyperspectral signatures um, from orbit, and C is the traverse um, color-coded by the regions that I'll be referring to. So Glen Torden in yellow is the uh, phyllosilicate-rich unit. 
um, which is overlain by the clay sulfate transition region, um, which has been found to have uh, hydrated magnesium <coughs> sulfate signatures from orbit, um, which has important implications for the history of water in Nile Crater. Uh, within the clay sulfate transition is the um, marker band valley, which hosts the Amapari marker band, which is a dark tone unit visible from orbit with high calcium pyroxene signatures. And uh, when the rover investigated it in situ, it found um, evidence of ripples. Uh, so the clay sulfate transition is really interesting in that um, it's been kind of hard to piece together geologically because there's lots of diagenesis going on, um, which produces textures like nodules, fins, and veins in the rock that happen post-deposition of the sediment. So Curiosity uses its instrument suite to define these stratigraphic units. Um, specifically, I'm interested in the mass cam, which are the two cameras on the mass of the rover and multispectral data that it can collect. But I also uh, consulted and analyzed data from uh, passive spectra from ChemCam, evolved gas analyses from SAM, XRD from ChemIn, and elemental data from APXS or the Alpha Particle X-ray spectrometer. I only have time to go into really APXS, but uh, I just want you to know that I did consult other data sets to inform my interpretations of these mass cam multispectral observations. So going into more detail about um, the mass cameras or mass cam, um, they're considered Curiosity's scientific eyes. Uh, they can acquire images through different wavelength filters at two different focal distances via this uh, spinning filter wheel here. So this spins and allows different wavelengths of light to pass through, um, recorded on a charge couple device, which is also found in cameras that many of you may use, like Nikons and Canons. Uh, but you may be wondering, well, how do we get like a spectrum from an image? First, we assess a color stretched image um, known as a decorrelation stretch, and this allows us to uh, find the very minute variations in color in the scene that our eyes would probably not be able to detect otherwise, and this ensures that I capture the full multispectral variability of the scene. So then I select regions of interest, or ROIs, in this image in uh, both eyes. Um, and by averaging the pixel values together in these ROIs, I can get spectra, as seen here. Uh, this ranges from wavelengths of 445 nanometers to 1,013 nanometers, which may seem kind of narrow. Um, but BASCAM is specifically sensitive to uh, iron oxides um, and iron-bearing minerals, and also some hydrated minerals. So the way that we can see how this structure is via band depths or absorptions. Um, large positive band depths, as seen on the left, uh, can indicate more iron oxides and or ferric minerals, whereas small negative band depths or just an overall more convex spectral profile can be indicative of more primary minerals. We can also look at slopes and ratios. Um, positive slopes in the near infrared are typical of dustier surfaces, whereas negative slopes um, can indicate olivine or other ferrous minerals. So my ultimate goal is to update mass cam rock spectral classes through the clay sulfate transition. Um, on the left is nine rock spectral um, classes defined, my, defined by my previous advisor using data um, from Curiosity's Traverse up until Glen Torridon and the clay sulfate transition. Um, so I suspected that you know, we would find new classes in accordance with unique stratigraphic units. Um, we can use these spectral classes to infer origins of flow rocks, degrees of alteration, make mineralogic interpretations, and also extend geologic units past um, what other instruments cannot necessarily reach. So getting into my results, uh, I used principal component analysis and uh, also plotted different spectral parameters on the x and y axes um, to deduce which parameters were contributing the most to the variability of the data set, and also which parameters best distinguish the um, spectra from one another. So this gave me um, four new spectral classes um, seen in polar here. So these new spectral classes are correlated with um, stratigraphy and or a unique surface type. Um, on the left is a uh, figure with uh, contributions of rock spectra from each class percent wise on the x axis and elevation on the y. Um, and as you can see, the pre-existing classes also persist persisted um, throughout this region of the traverse. Um, but I also defined new classes. Um, 
So the purple class J uh, occurs on dusty marker band surfaces, whereas the blue class L occurs on less dusty marker band surfaces. Uh, the green class K occurs um, uh, on targets with very heavy diagenetic overprints with lots of nodules and fins, and occurs more often in the clay sulfate transition than glentoridin. And then lastly, I identified uh, the red class M, which directly correlates with our excursions onto the green hue pediment and also uh, float rocks in its approach. So just reminding you again of what these look like, and I was particularly interested in uh, the purple class J because that negative slope in the last two wavelength filters could indicate a hydration feature that's inherent but not necessarily unique to hydrated magnesium sulfates. Um, I did a laboratory study that revealed that you would need near 90 to 100 percent weight percent um, mag hydrated magnesium sulfate, depending on what other mineral it's mixed with, in order to reproduce this feature in mass dam spectra. Um, so it was uh, with, diff with data from other instruments, I knew that that feature wasn't correlated to hydrated magnesium sulfates. But I, could, I, um, I consulted uh, this specific rock class that was identified by MassCam's uh, successor, MassCam Z, on the Perseverance rover that showed very similar spectra on very similar surfaces um, that is indicative of a hydrated dust coating. So this is what I found in Gale Crater. This is where class J appears and the resulting spectrum that you get from such a surface. So for the other classes, um, uh, we can look at a mixture of minerals to characterize each class. I did do um, a more quantitative uh, analysis to come to these conclusions, but believe it or not, it's less fun to look at than all of these squiggly lines. So I just have to take my word for it. Um, that class K could be characterized by iron sulfates, magnetite, basaltic glass, and olivine. Um, interestingly, Ken Min, the XRD instrument, did not identify iron sulfates, um, which means that if it was present, it would have to be present in the amorphous component, which is not crystalline. Um, the class L, uh, it closely matches um, calcium pyroxene spectra, which totally tracks with the marker band. Um, and then class M is kind of similar to basaltic components, with tr which tracks with green pediment. And then I classified all of the APXS targets by um, taking a multispectral observation of them. Um, and uh, this revealed more elemental correlations. So uh, classes J and M, those new classes I defined, which correlate to the marker band and green hue pediment, are chemically distinct from other classes. While the pre-existing or predefined class C, which was originally interpreted to um, reflect like non trinite and olivine, is actually creating a magnesium sulfate trend line. So I came to the conclusion that classes K and C may indicate sulfates, with uh, more iron oxides or non trinite contributing to um, class C, and magnesium sulfate with that, um, it has a very flat spectral profile with that uh, negative slope that I had talked about earlier. It could be possibly just lifting up that right side of the 867 nanometer band depth resulting in class C. Um, evolved gas analyses from a SAM shows that there is amorphous iron sulfate in all of the clay sulfate transition targets. So I hypothesized that a, bas a basaltic component and an amorphous iron sulfate could characterize class K. I was able to uh, also compare this to a laboratory mixture made by my colleague Elizabeth Skloop uh, of 50% basalt and 50% amorphous iron sulfate, and we can see that it retains that negative near infrared slope. However, we're not seeing this 527 nanometer band depth, which, so I would be interested in adding uh, an iron oxide to this to see if I could replicate that band depth while also retaining the negative slope. So class K and class C has interesting implications for alteration in the clay sulfate transition. And this is how I think that these rocks could, be, could have formed. Um, under a carbon dioxide rich atmosphere, uh, iron sulfides rarely break down, which promotes the acidic weathering of um, silicate minerals like olivine um, into, the, uh, uh, into cations such as magnesium and iron, which then can be incorporated into their respective sulfates. 
uh, iron specifically uh, would either have to be rapidly incorporated into a ferrous sulfate or more likely um, oxidized and then incorporated into a ferric sulfate, both of which would have to rapidly dehydrate to become either an iron hydroxy sulfate or an amorphous ferric sulfate. And then with the addition of the hypothesized wet dry cycles, I'm proposing that uh, these amorphous sulfates could cement together basaltic grains um, and also incorporate, you know, the iron oxides also get in there and uh, with further oxidation could form more. So I will leave you the with these conclusions uh, and thank you. the green hue pediment, we could see the pediment off into the distance, so we took multispectral observations at a distance as well as the float rocks, and we found that specific areas did correlate and match. Um, and then once we also uh, got onto the green hue pediment, like we were able to confirm that with more observations. And it was, that was actually a really fun one because um, the team has been seeing these foreign stones as they've been labeled, yes. and, yes, and uh, <laughs> They really match quite well spectrally to the green hue pediment, so that's where um, that infirm the origins of float rocks comes in. Oh, thank you. Um, I was just curious, um, with inferring the wet dry cycles from this data, are you able to get any sense of what the time scales were like? That's a great question. Uh, I don't have a great answer for that one. Uh, Yeah, I'm not from multispectral data. So, so really interesting work, Lydia, thank you. Um, so I, I guess, kind of speaking to this last point, what sorts of geologic processes would result in amorphous versus crystalline uh, iron sulfide? Yeah, so uh, the rapid dehydration is what primarily controls that um, from being amorphous and crystalline. So with these wet dry cycles, they were very like intermittent and short, um, which I guess, it, going back to the timeline, I, uh, the wet dry cycles, they happen over a long period of time, but they went back and forth very quickly, um, interpreted from other uh, data from the rover. Um, so I, th I think that could happen. It's also, um, Really interesting that there weren't, there were a lot less phyllosilicates as we turns it, uh, traversed into the phyllosilicate sulfate transition region. There's actually much <laughs> less phyllosilicates, um, so the iron sulfates kind of indicate this like more acidic environment, which could have precluded the clay formation. Um, yeah, I sorry that kind of went off but uh, yeah. Right. Thank you very much, Olivia. Jelis Cortes, uh, Sostre Cortes, uh, quantifying presently active dune evolution on Mars. All right, yeah, take it away. Hi. <laughs> Hi, everyone. So my name is Jelis Sostre Cortes, and I'll be talking about some of the work I did during a JPL internship with Dr. Serena Diniega, and then I continued on to work um, on this project as one of my undergrad research uh, with <coughs> Banacor as my faculty advisor, but now I'm a PhD student here in the Planetas Research Lab with Dr. Frances Rivera Hernandez. And, okay, 
So as a bit of an introduction to Mars, um, the Martian surface dynamics and modification are dominated by aeolian processes, which are wind-driven processes that are capable of transporting sediments through vast distances on the planet. And it's important to note that the atmospheric density of Mars is 1,000th that of Earth's. And so these aeolian processes um, are sort of the interaction between the atmosphere and the surface. And these sediment transport results can um, result in the formation of mod and modification of these landforms. And it's interesting to look into this landform of these alien processes in Mars because unlike Earth, there's no ve vegetation on Mars to influence the development of these landforms. And so a little bit more into the importance of these aeolian features. Um, the focus of my research was on protodunes, which are early stage aeolian bed forms that eventually grow to become mature dunes. So the focus on this research is on baby dunes. Um, <laughs> and I wanted to investigate the dunes evolution and how they first develop because that can offer insight into the dunes environment or the forming environment and give insight into these factors that can influence and shape the pattern that the dunes will take, like wind velocity and wind direction. And this can also give us a better understanding of how these landforms evolve and lead to a better comprehension of Martian climate dynamics that form them. So this is a high-rise image. Um, all of the images that you're going to be seeing here are high-rise images. Um, but here I just wanted to show an example of what these protodunes could look like. So everything that is circled in red, these are protodunes, and the ones that are not are more mature dunes. And the red arrow is just showing the wind direction of this field. And over here, you can see a close-up image of this protodune here. So uh, part of the pre preliminary work evidence that the selected study sites for this um, did show to have been presently active and evolving. And so what I first did as part of the internship was to look at the maturity stages of these protodunes. And so something, a protodune or a aeolian bed form with a maturity stage one would meet an irregular sand of pat, a patch of sand with little ripple organization. And maturity stage two would be um, more sand that has been accumulated and it already showcasing a visible ripple pattern on the surface. And maturity stage three would be protodunes with evidence of grainfall, which is loose sediment at the downwind side of the protodune. Um, and that would mean that there's sort of already a slip phase beginning to form. And so there's up to five um, maturity stages, but the four and five and beyond, those are more mature dunes, and that's no longer a protodune. And so to take, to kind of have a sense of the activity levels of these protodunes, I came up with these categories. And so it was to differentiate and quantify the changes that I was observing on these protodunes. So an activity level one would mean that there was scattered sand of the margins of the protodune. Activity level two would be changes in the ripple pattern on the surface. And activity level number three would mean that there was observable migration of the whole protodune. And so here is an image example showing uh, how these protodune margins change from Mars year 29, which is in green, to Mars year 35. So that would be around from 2007 to 2019, more or less. And so here we can see uh, another example of activity, which is activity level three, which is protodune migration. Um, and these two time steps are from Mars year 31 to Mars year 35. So this would be from 2011 to 2019, roughly. Um, 
And here we can see two different protodunes, one becoming uh, maturity stage three because there's already a uh, kind of slip phase forming over here. And over on this side, we have still a maturity stage number two and activity level three because as you can tell, the protodune migrated into this low crater here. As well as this one, you can see it also migrated along the wind direction. And so this is the other field site that I was looking into. Here, these images are from Mars year 29 to Mars year 36, which is 2007 to 2021, more or less. And in this case, the wind direction is from east to west. And we have three protodunes here, um, ranging from maturity stages two, and this one in the middle would be a maturity stage three here, because uh, we're on this side, there's a slip phase beginning to form. And as the previous one, these all protodunes showed to have migrated along the wind direction. And so to look into the relationship between maturity and the size of the protodunes, um, I found that the protodunes with higher maturity are generally larger than those with lower maturity, which makes sense because as time passes by, the protodunes develop and have more time to accumulate sand. And this was evidenced by these graphs showing that the measured area of each protodune um, versus its maturity stage. And so going into what I did as part of my undergrad research, which was quantifying how much these protodunes were actually evolving by calculating the sand flux. And so the objective here was to quantify the evolution rate of these protodunes by generating the sand flux estimate, which is defined as the volume of sand that passes through a line of unit length perpendicular to the wind direction per unit of time. <laughs> There'll be an equation later. <laughs> and this is generally used to characterize the sediment transport of a specific region, and it can be used to estimate the accumul accumulation of sand in the dunes. And so I wanted to do this because previous studies did, have not yielded significant information regarding the formation processes and the subsequent evolution of protodunes. And so the goal was to expand on these previous studies. Um, and the study site selection is the two field sites that um, you saw in the previous slides, and we were looking for a um, dune field with simple complexity, preferably with unimodal wind flow or wind direction in just one direction, and that showed examples of sand movement, isolation to other <coughs> natural dunes, and being in proximity to the upwind margin. And it's important to have it isolated from other mature dunes because then if you had a proto-dune over here, the <coughs> sand grains from the more mature dunes would be influencing the development of that proto-dune. And so here's a map of Mars <laughs> showing a bit of um, what had been previously calculated in terms of sand fluxes and in different regions. So over here would be my field site A and my field site B. And here are some sand flux estimates that have been previously calculated um, around these, those regions. And later on, my conclusions, you will see that my results kind of reflect this, what was previously studied as well. And so as part of the measurements, I took um, the wavelength between the ripples, which is used to gener generate the height estimates of the protodune. Um, and it's averaged from a line along the wind direction and perpendicular to 10 measurements of the crest-to-crest -crest distances of the ripples. And I also wanted to quantify the migration by an estimation of the change in position from of the protodune margin, which is what you see here by these two different lines. Um, and the time delta, which would be the time difference in Earth days from the two overlapping images, um, converted then to Mars year by dividing by 100, uh, 687, which would be the length of a Mars year. And that's where this equation comes in to calculate um, the estimated sand fluxes. Um, 
So here we see that for field site A, um, they varied by approximately 8.89, 8 8 2.25, and 3.15 meters cubed per meter per Mars year. Um, and these changes could be because of some changes in local winds that may be affecting the sediment transport of into these dune, this specific dune field. And then for field type B, they range a lot closely to each other, which could be um, due to the protodunes having less variation in the local winds of that field site, or also because the study sites were a lot closer together than the ones in field site A. And some variations within the field site A, like I mentioned, I also used two different time delta, 3.07 and 4.01 Mars year. Um, and also, what this is just looking into more of those variations within field site A. Um, but really, it could be due because of the changes in local wind affecting the sediment transport into the dune field. And just a little discussion that these sand fluxes here are within the low side of the spectrum, but they do correlate with what was previously shown in that map. And it could just be the result of limited winds within the low density Martian atmosphere. Um, but there's still evidence of wind events strong enough to cause the observable migration in these protodunes and the changes in the ripple patterns. And these values um, did range by approximately a factor of two from other studies, but it's still within the range of what was shown in that map. And these results demonstrate that the Martian climate dynamics can be fairly consistent within the studied regions. And some general conclusions, um, these wind-driven processes are the most widespread and dominant source of terrain alteration on the surface of present-day Mars. And some of the general contributions of this project is that to have a better understanding of the processes that shape these landscapes. Um, and this, this serves as a survey of the changes and quantification of the growth of these protodunes. And the sand fluxes evident, are evidence that these protodunes on Mars are effectively actively evolving today. And future work could include a larger survey of more protodunes and how do these compare to the sand fluxes of more um, mature dunes. Um, and some acknowledgments and references. <laughs> Thank you. personal bias. <laughs> but yeah, it would be really interesting to look at these ads in person. Because I was um, captured by your last discussion point where you had like this uh, consistent, um, yeah, consistent climate dynamics. And I wonder if like these patterns that you're seeing would be evident in dust deposition in ice, for example. Right. Because these uh, field sites are generally at the same, yeah. But yeah, it would be interesting to see, to compare the two, if it was possible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Lydia, this is really, really cool work. Um, so I, was, I have a really basic question. Um, it, what is it about the, the local regions that, that cause dunes to form where they do? The local... Like, you, know, you have a global map of, of Mars here, but, but zooming in to, to sort of where the dunes are forming, what is it about, is, is it just that there's a lot of sand available? Is there some sort of morphology of the surface? Like, why do the dunes end up where they are? Yeah, it could come down to just the sand availability and also, like, some of these uh, dune fields are generally within craters. Okay. That could also influence how the wind is interacting with the surface, basically. Um, but yes. <laughs> great, great, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, you could get a good workout. <laughs> <laughs>
question. Uh, I wasn't really looking into their destruction. I was a bit more focused on them forming. Um, that would be interesting to look at too. Yeah. I mean, the disruption, I don't, I mean, I don't think they really get disrupted more than they maybe the wind direction changes. Mm. So. All right. Let's thank our speaker again. research scientist in the uh, Ratcliffe Laboratory here, and uh, this will be a bit more of a biology-oriented talk. So, Phanerozoic period, the last 600-ish million years, there's all kinds of interesting multicellular diversity and biomass. This is what made this epoch of Earth's history what it is, all these interesting things, and again, all these interesting multicellular organisms and multicellularity just keeps coming. There's, it, there's lots of separate origins of it. Um, but this is very specifically in the Phanerozoic. This is the most recent epoch of Earth's history. And really, Earth has been three different worlds. It has worked very differently at different uh, periods of time. And one of the biggest differences between these different periods in Earth's history is Oxygen. You go from having none to having some to having a lot. And the time that you have a lot is when all these big, interesting multicellular organisms appeared. That may not be a coincidence. And so we're, we're looking to understand what is the role of Earth's oxygenation in this uh, evolution of multicellularity. So we work with something called snowflake yeast. Um, this is a model system for examining very simple multicellularity. It's just regular old S. cerevisiae baker's yeast uh, with a single mutation that makes the daughters not quite fall off of their mothers when the cells bud. 
And so you get this uh, nice little nugget of uh, fractal yeast. And it's a night we do laboratory evolution for increased size. They learn to be bigger. They learn to cooperate a little better. It's a nice model for the early evolution of a multicellular organism. And we've got some previous work in the lab uh, using it as a model system for examining oxygen with regards to simple multicellularity. So this is uh, from a, uh, another research scientist in our lab, Ozan Bozdeg. He's got some really cool work on this. Basically, um, if you change the um, oxygen availability to these things, you drastically change their uh, evolution to large size. And to zoom in on one subset of those results, if you force them to use oxygen and you don't supplement the oxygen, they stay small. If you force them to use oxygen and you do supplement the oxygen, they get big over the course of several months of continued transfers and evolution. So what else can we use, what else can we ask about uh, oxygen and multicellularity? And that is, what organisms became phototrophic when and what were their adaptations? Um, you'll notice if you look at what organisms became multicellular when, all the large complex multicells in the Proterozoic, this middle period where Earth's oxygen was low, are phototrophs. There's not really any heterotrophs that became big and multicellular. Um, and I think this is because they are, do not fully depend on respiration. They have another energy source that they can use when oxygen cannot get into their innards. Um, they, are otherwise, they would otherwise be size limited by being able to respire on the inside and with um, the ability to get energy from light, they don't have to. And then in the Phanerozoic, you get animals and they manipulate oxygen diffusion with oxygen binding proteins. Everybody loves uh, hemoglobin circulating in blood. You've also got myoglobin. You've also got hemorrhythrins. There's, there's a whole diversity of these things. So I uh, decided to um, put my synthetic biology hat on and um, actually incorporate both of these adaptations into snowflake yeast and see what happens. So let's talk about oxygen binding proteins. Um, they seem to have appeared when oxygen rose at the, in the Phanerozoic, the not before. So the, there's a bunch of these things, but the two oldest ones are globins and hemorrhythrins. Um, as for globins, people study those a lot more because those are the ones that our lineage has. Um, we, everybody loves hemoglobin circulating in blood, but the first globins were not circulating. Circulation is late and weird. It was invented a dozen times separately. The first ones were sitting around stationary in tissue. Um, hemorrhythrins, something similar. Um, so the interesting question is, why did they only evolve when oxygen was already high? You might imagine that moving oxygen around would have been even more useful when it was low. So we've done some really interesting experiments. I have to plug um, Whitney Wong, a research uh, technician who worked with me on this project. She did a lot of the uh, actual experiments, and uh, she was and she moved on to other things, but her work has been phenomenal. So the question here is, what are the oxygen binding proteins doing? Um, Ultimately, it's facilitated diffusion. These proteins, even though they're not moving around in bulk, they're diffusing constantly. And they take up oxygen where it's high and give it up where it's low. So you have these diffusible oxygen binding sites in addition to diffusible oxygen itself. And so we added these to yeast. We added myoglobin and myohemorrhythrin. These are two separately invented oxygen binding proteins. Took them from a sperm whale and a peanut worm just because those are the most well-studied ones due to vagaries of pre-genomic molecular biology. And uh, we, um, and you need to also do a few modifications so the yeast actually make enough heme to um, get to load up the myoglobin with the iron, but we were able to do this. And wouldn't you know it, when you uh, express the myoglobin in the yeast, they turn pink. Um, I don't have a nice picture for the myohemerythrin because that's colorless when it's not oxygenated and a big suffocating pellet is not going to be oxygenated. Um, and we introduce both of these proteins into snowflake yeast of different sizes. We can manipulate their size genetically. And so we did some nice analysis of their physiology. And this is a graph of the fitness given 
the excess fitness given to yeast forced to grow aerobically in a, sort of an intermediate oxygen level where we're not supplementing it and supplemental. And my, myoglobin and myohemerythrin for small and large cells. The small cells don't really get any benefit from supple in supplemental oxygen from these proteins. They get a small benefit at the intermediate levels. But the big ones get more benefit at intermediate and a whole lot when you supplement the oxygen. So um, it's interesting. The, Small ones get more benefit at uh, more benefit at low than high. The large ones get more benefit at high than low, and the large ones get way more benefit. And um, it's it's striking. So how can we explain this? So we started doing some simulations of a uh, coupled diffusion of oxygen, um, uh, cup, uh, diffusing into the interior of these things and being metabolized. And, I have to thank Pablo Bravo for helping code up this model in uh, the Julia modeling environment. So you can see here you've got different traces of the rate of uh, metabolism in large and small clusters at different oxygen levels with and without the uh, with and without the oxygen binding proteins. And so you see the globins, they increase the penetration depth of oxygen at many different circumstances, but most strikingly the small ones, they're already oxygenated at high oxygen, so it doesn't help them. So that explains part of it. Um, and we can sweep through all kinds of different variables here. We can sweep through different oxygen levels and different radii of the organisms and see how much selective advantage these uh, globins give them. And in short, we get back that larger organisms have greater benefit from uh, globin expression than small organisms. And large organisms benefit more from globin at mid to high oxygen levels than at very low. At the very low levels here, it actually just falls to basically, falls to nearly zero. And you can, you can slice this up. You can see nice little graphs of how it works at different size organisms, but then if you do a little more math, you can see this is the fraction of size-based growth decline that is canceled out by the globin expression. And you can see it's low at low oxygen, and then it rises, and it's basically, uh, and then it's basically flat above a critical oxygen level. So again, as oxygen level rises, the um, globins help more and more and more and more. So uh, in short, globins and oxygen binding proteins, they circumvent anatomical limitations to diffusion once oxygen is plentiful. They're not as useful when it's not plentiful because they're all about, because uh, if there's not oxygen round to be had, they, they, there's nothing for them to do. Once it's high, they can do more. Um, and it's beneficial for the evolution of increased size in um, some laboratory evolution experiments that we've, just, that we've uh, done some pilot experiments on. And it's more helpful when oxygen's high, and it's more helpful for big organisms, which explains when, when it appeared. And we're exploring more parameter spaces in the diffusion model, and we're expressing more proteins, and we're going to be doing some nice laboratory evolution experiments with some better optimized strains that are actually making enough heme to load up all of their globins. But most of the uh, first set of strains actually weren't loading their proteins. So then what about phototrophy? Um, no one's got time to give these things chlorophyll. That would be 30 genes. But you can give them uh, a retinal phototrophic microbial rhodopsin. It's a single gene, 27 kilodalton protein, pumps one proton per photon. And if you feed them the pigment, that's all, that's all you need. It's incredibly simple to give them these things. And so uh, we actually went and pulled a rhodopsin from a uh, plant pathogen, corn smut fungus. Um, it uh, goes to a, mem to a compartment called the vacuole. We put it in the yeast, and wouldn't you know it, it goes exactly where it's supposed to go and does exactly what it's supposed to do. And, uh, what we, uh, and what's going on here is the vacuole um, has these uh, ATP-driven proton pumps, and you are uh, adding this light-driven proton pump that's doing the same thing. And so either you stop that pump from using energy, or you might be able to reverse it. And so a lot of these terms were done by Autumn Peterson, a graduate student in the lab. Again, I must plug the people who have been so necessary for this work. And in short, uh, 
You, low, you have this vacuole rhodopsin, and you have light-dependent fitness effects. In, um, they have a very slight fitness defect in the dark and a slight fitness benefit in the light, 2% growth advantage relative to the dark in the light. So we're able to do this. And so these vacuolar ones work. What about putting it into a mitochondrion? Um, this doesn't happen in nature, but it's potentially more useful because the mitochondria is actually made for making ATP. The other ones are supposed to be consuming it. So what happens if we localize some things there? So we used a, uh, someone else's um, modified uh, mitochondrial rhodopsin for this. They were trying to um, alter cells to be more stress resistant. We're trying to actually make ATP with it. And so we induce this protein a little bit. We've got some GFP fusions. It uh, goes uh, in these puncta all over the cells inside the mitochondria. But when we start making too much of this protein, bad things start to happen at a tiny fraction of the amount of the other protein. Um, the whole mitochondrial network just collapses and crystallizes and everything dies. So we need to be really careful about expressing. There, there, might, be, there may be a reason this doesn't happen in nature. Um, but at the low expression levels, we can induce it. At low expression levels, we can get fitness benefits of up to about 3% in the light compared to the dark at very small amounts of protein. So we have not yet um, done a lot of work on the physiology of these things in a multicellular context. Um, but we've concluded that we can turn the yeast into photoheterotrophs, getting energy from light. The mitochondrial rhodopsins may be significantly better because very tiny amounts of the protein are doing more than a lot of the other protein. And we're actually 48 hours away from having yeast that um, can use a rhodopsin as their only energy source, like what we're messing with their mitochondria. <laughs> and um, and, and continue this, we're, we're introducing and testing more rhodopsins before we do the detailed experiments here because um, we think we can do better than the ones we already have and we've already published. Um, I'm really looking forward to some cyanobacterial rhodopsins into the mitochondria because if anything's not going to screw up the mitochondria, it'll be something from a cyanobacteria. And one, then we'll characterize the physiological effects and do our long-term evolution experiments. So with that, thanks to everyone on the team that has helped, and I will take any questions. First, like the rhodopsin in your yeast, that's kind of just incredible. I'll be thinking about that for a long time. But my question <laughs> was about the first part, which was uh, do you consider the role of reactive oxygen species in some of your experiments on your yeast and its reaction to the low levels and high levels of oxygen? Mm -hmm. um, we have not gone and measured any of that. Um, it would be interesting. I have heard from other people that the um, myohemerythrins may have interesting effects on reactive oxygen species with, their, um, with what their little iron atoms are able to bind and react with. Um, we have not gone and looked at that. These are modern proteins. So it's not like we're going, the, these, the ones we have tried are not, we haven't gone back to like the ancient roots where they may have been doing redox enzymes, but, um, but yeah, we, and, um, we, they are, when we, when we run our simulations, it's really just a question of extending how deep into the yeast very low oxygen levels go. So whatever they're doing, it's prob they're probably going to be behaving kind of like they're just at very low oxygen levels. Yeah, no, I understand that. Uh, that and that's a great explanation. It just seems that oftentimes intracellularly, these reactive oxygen species are generated and something that you know, must be dealt with. So I think it's, it adds just an interesting nuance to your very cool project. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you. talking about anaerobic biological formation of manganese oxides in the Gulf of Mexico, deep hypersaline anoxic basin. <clears throat> All right, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm Claire. I'm a PhD candidate in the Ocean Science and Engineering program, um, and I work with Jennifer Glass. 
Um, and in particular, this work is part of the Oceans Across Space and Time project. Um, and what I'm going to talk about is anaerobic biological formation of manganese oxides. And this is very much uh, sort of work in progress um, because we went to see this summer. So kind of a story of what's going on so far. Um, and so manganese, um, historically, it's been used, um, manganese enrichments have been used as a way to sort of date certain uh, events uh, in geology. Um, and that is because manganese 2 um, is a dissolved form. And then when it's converted to manganese um, 4 or manganese oxide, it's in a particular form, particulate form. And it's, um, it's pretty stable. So once manganese oxides are formed, they stay pretty well throughout time. Um, and so what I'm showing you here is a really nice review that talks about biotic, abiotic, uh, modern observations and Archean ge geochemical data that sort of go over all of the different mechanisms for which manganese oxides are formed from manganese too. Um, and the big one is, of course, um, interactions with oxygen, both abiotically and biotically. But I want to focus here today um, on this one, which is manganese 2 um, and nitrate forming manganese oxides. Um, and this is still kind of a proposed mechanism, and that is because, and by the way, I look at metabolism, so I look at redox towers a lot. Um, so what we do when we breathe, we're using oxygen, and we're converting it to CO2 here. Um, these two are really far away from each other on the redox tower, so you get a lot of energy when you couple those two. If you look at manganese 2 to manganese oxide, so dissolved to particulate form, coupled to uh, nitrate to ammonium or nitrate to nitrite, they're basically right next to each other on the redox tower. You're not getting a lot of energy if you're using this. So if that is the case, is this metabolism even possible? And if so, where would this even occur? Um, and so this idea came from um, looking at anoxic marine basins or portions of the ocean where oxygen is suddenly gone. There is um, an amount of manganese oxides that can't really be explained away with abiotic formation or aerobic biotic formation. So there's this kind of this gap where mysterious manganese oxides are formed, probably biologically, and so this idea that nitrate could be used as an oxidant. So for um, anoxic marine systems, um, I'm going to talk about a really extreme one. So these are called deep hypersaline anoxic basins. They're very salty. Um, they're about eight times salinity of normal marine salt water. They're formed by evaporitic deposits. They sort of crack open. All this salt gets shoved up. It forms this hypersaline anoxic water, this brine. We have this halocline right above it where oxygen is zero in this area. Salinity starts increasing and temperature decreases. Um, and this is what happens if you go into the brine pool. Wouldn't recommend it. This eel didn't have a very good time. Um, so that's just how intense these brine pools can look. It, it, it looks like a lake in the middle of the ocean or in the bottom of the ocean. It's usually where these are forming. And so focusing in on the dehab that we went to, we went to the Gulf of Mexico Orca Basin. Um, this is also a big site for oil drilling, part of the whole evaporative deposits idea. There's a lot of hydrocarbons that also get uh, flushed up in this area, so lots of activity. Um, well, what's also really cool about these dehabs, in particular Orca Basin, has been previously characterized, um, is that they are really abundant in manganese. So sometimes in uh, marine systems, manganese is only existing in picomoles. Whereas if we're looking at the Orca Basin, this is an anoxic, uh, deep hypersaline brine right here, a lot of stuff just gets built up. And in particular, we're seeing these particulate manganese, so again, manganese oxides, have this really distinct pink here. And if you're looking at it like I do, um, I think about it as a metabolic crumb. So if I'm thinking about formation of manganese oxides biotically, um, this is a really good place to start, looking at places in the water where you're seeing this insane increase of something that takes a lot of energy to form. 
So, this is time. And so this is our data from the Orca Basin. Um, it's very stratified, and there's not a lot of advection. So these um, data points stay pretty consistent over time, but we take them every time. Anyway, so we can see uh, around 20 to 50 meters is where the brine pool starts. So this um, salinity right here, this is normal ocean water, and then very, very, very salty. Um, right above that, oxygen is pretty much gone. What I want to point out is really interesting here is if we're looking at nitrate, so again, thinking earlier about that nitrate as the electron acceptor, it starts to get pulled down about where oxygen is gone. That's really common because nitrate is a really good terminal electron acceptor after oxygen. And we're also seeing some dissolved manganese too is available. What's interesting for me is when you pull up this previous data for the particulate manganese oxides, it corresponds really well to where there is no oxygen, nitrate is being used, and there's some manganese. So because of that, I formed this hypothesis that microbes are using nitrate for manganese 2 oxidation to manganese oxides, um, and they're forming these oxides around their cells, and in particular at this 2200 meter mark. So now I have to go get the microbes. Uh, always fun at sea. So I had two mechanisms, or ways I wanted to approach this problem. So I took bottle cultures with an anoxic procedure just to make sure when I pulled it up from the water, I wasn't suddenly flooding it with oxygen um, and, you know, ruining it. Um, so I used an anoxic procedure. And then um, in the cold van, which is at the same temperature from where this water is taken in the water column, I added nitrogen gas um, just to make sure that it was overpressured and oxygen wasn't seeping in. And I also gave them a lot more nitrate, just to make them really happy. <laughs> I also uh, collected samples and filtered them for microscopy. And in particular, I did that. And you can see this. Um, these are from different ports uh, of the water column. But you can sort of see here, this is at 2,200 meters. Um, it's really dark. Um, so that also um, is indicative of manganese oxides, because you get that nice sort of purpley color. Um, but in particular, I wanted to use a method that was previously established in the glass lab, and this is called signal staining. Um, so you use LBB, which is very specific to manganese oxides. If you put it on the filter and it turns blue, it's manganese oxide. And you can use cyber stain, which basically is a DNA stain, and if it's green, you're looking at a cell. So when you do these two stains together and you overlay them after you um, overexpose it, you can start to really see if there are manganese oxides and where they are. So again, this is what we're looking at if we're thinking manganese oxides and salts. And so here's one of the examples for 2200 meters. We're seeing lots of cells here, which is exciting. Um, this is just taken um, in the image for the cells. You can see there's kind of these dark splotches, which are particles. Um, but then when you're also doing that stain, you can see in this exact same spot um, those particles are blue, which means they're manganese oxides. And when you overlay them, um, they're corresponding really, really well. So kind of the main um, exciting takeaway I have so far is that these oxides are present and they're associating with the cells at this 2200 meter peak. Um, and a lot of this processing and imaging was done uh, by these two undergrads, Helen and Emma. They were really fantastic. Um, and just put so much beautiful work into making these images happen, which is very exciting. Um, and as a kind of sort of negative control, I guess, so this is the anoxic core. Uh, there's just a lot of stuff in the anoxic core, in particular particles. Um, so if you were thinking about looking for cells associating with particles, you'd think this would be kind of a place where you would see that. And you're not seeing that. You're seeing a lot of particles. You're seeing some cells, but they're not co-localizing. And they're also um, no manganese oxides, no blue. Um, so it really seems like this is a very unique part of the water column. Um, and so what's more, what I'm working on now um, currently is this transfer enrichment. So like I said, I took anoxic water samples back at Tech. I sparged some of them with methane and some of them with helium, just to see if that made a difference. Um, I'm interested in methane a lot, so I'd like to see if it does anything. Um, 
And so I did transfers of these original cultures into more of that dehab water from that depth. And I gave um, all of these bottles 100 micromolars of nitrate and 50 micromolars of manganese 2 dissolved. Um, I just want to point out, this is an insane amount of manganese for most cells. Cells are not happy when you give them that amount of manganese usually. Um, so to see them do anything is exciting. Um, and then there are two uh, spectro, so color changing assays you can do. Basically, um, a grease assay, if the color decreases, nitrate is being cooled down. LBB, that same uh, blue color, as that blue color increases, it's very nicely linear. That means there's more manganese oxides. And so uh, the first one is these transfer enrichments are reducing nitrate. Um, so it's being pulled down slowly and very nicely. Um, so I have uh, these methane bottles here, these circles, um, and then helium bottles as these squares. And this is just from two different um, time points, essentially, that I took these bottles. And I'm also really excited about this, is that these are uh, these these bottles are oxidizing manganese to, to manganese oxides. And you can actually see the particles forming in the bottle. They, um, and then they also change color, which is really exciting. Um, but as you can see, this hasn't been going on very long. So it's a little preliminary. Um, these are my future directions. There's a lot of them, because like I said, it's a work in progress. But I'm really interested right now, in particular, imaging the particles themselves um, and seeing if they're different or unique. Um, and then also I want to point out metagenomic and metatranscriptomic data. Jordan is going to talk about her work on the Orca Basin, um, and she does a lot of really cool metagenomic stuff. Um, and then cell activity is also something I'm really interested to look at, see if um, these additions are making the cells more or less active. Um, I'd like to thank the Glass Lab at Georgia Tech. Like I said, Helen and Emma, these undergrads, um, my funding and SFGRFP, as well as this astrobiology uh, oceans across space and time project, the funding and also the team has been really, really great to collaborate with. RV Point Sur crew and research group, um, they keep the boat running so we can actually do stuff in the first place. Um, this is the group here at sea, um, and then also LoneCon, which is where we're based out of. And that's it. Thank you. Methane to some bottles, and I was wondering, did you have a hypothesis on maybe like, is there evidence for methanotropes in that level of water column, or like, what, what, what encouraged you to do that? Um, great question. Um, so I, I think I, I can't remember if I mentioned it or not. So there's a lot of hydrocarbons and methanes um, being upwelled. Also, um, so this is kind of just. Sort of the idea of methanotrophy. Um, I'm interested in any sort of methane oxidation, um, and I also just just curiosity as well. I have no reason to explain yet why this guy seems to be a lot happier than the others. <laughs> Interesting stuff. I was wondering the um. Where is the manganese coming from? Like, what, what, what is the source of that? And um, is it unique to that area, or would it be anywhere that there wasn't lots of oxygen around? Can you see the, the last part real quick? Um, is the, is the, um, is, is the, uh, would the, would that manganese be anywhere that there's, would, that there was not a lot of oxygen, or is it sort of special to that area? No, so throughout, Ocean basins, manganese is usually one of those very, very trace metals or minerals or whatever you want to think about it. Um, so the way I understand it with dehabs is there's no advective mixing. So you have this brine pool and basically everything just sort of slowly piles up on top of it as you're getting deeper and oxygen is not being pulled up or advected up and down, so it's basically, um, if you were to think about just metals and stuff in the water column, it's kind of everyone's just getting piled on top of it and increasing a lot. That's as far as I understand it. 
Thank you, Claire. We'll do some uh, microphone adjusting real quick because we were getting a little bit of feedback. But up next is Sarah Kingsley, one of our astrobiology fellows for this year. She will be giving her talk on detection and identification of microorganisms by VOC analysis. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sarah. I'm a fourth year PhD student in the Orlando group. And as Colin said, I'm going to be talking about detection and identification of microorganisms. Now, I know this is technically an astrobiology meeting, but we're going to be talking about a little different kind of life detection today. Um, and that is detecting microorganisms in manned spacecrafts. If you use the mouse and click on okay. for one second, it should. Yeah. And now I can use this? Yeah, sure. Okay, um, okay great. So uh, keeping track of the microbial population in manned spacecraft is very important. Microbes can make humans sick, they can contaminate food supplies, and they can cause damage to the vehicle itself. So the current way that this is done on the International Space Station is that samples are collected from air, water, and surfaces. Then they're cultured for a few days and then sent to Earth for analysis quarterly. So this works fine for the ISS, but has a major limitation that it is completely reliant on the Earth for analysis. So it would not be suitable outside of low Earth orbit. Oh. OK. So another technique that's recently come out uses, uh, again, samples collected from air, water, and surfaces. These samples, uh, or the DNA in these, detecting these samples is amplified with PCR, and then sequenced using a nanopore sequencer to identify microbes. Uh, and this technique has actually been very successful. It has been used, uh, tested on the ISS, and they were able to detect bacteria and identify it at a species level without doing any culturing or sending samples to Earth for analysis. So this does provide a way um, to detect and identify microbes fully on board a spacecraft. However, these kinds of methods can be a little costly, and they're always going to require either a human or a robot to do some sample prep. So there is some interest in uh, some more low maintenance methods. Uh, and one of the techniques that can provide a method like this is potentially uh, VOC analysis. Okay, so VOCs, or volatile organic compounds, are basically gas-based molecules. It's pretty well understood that microorganisms emit VOCs through metabolic activity. These can be used to study de or to detect microorganisms, to identify them into different groups. They can use to study uh, communication and interactions between microorganisms, and also study uh, antibiotic resistance and pathogenicity. So in my research, we're ultimately interested in contributing to a method of detection and identification of microbes in space habitats. So we're mainly interested in these two. Um, now, to develop a kind of method like this, there's a few things we need to understand about the VOCs emitted by microorganisms. Uh, so the first thing is reproducibility. If we're going to be using VOCs as an indicator and identifier of microbes, then we need to know, um, is the set of VOCs emitted every single time you analyze this organism under a given set of conditions, or is there going to be some variation? We also need to understand how specific we can get with our identification. Ideally, we would like to be able to identify microorganisms at the species level because that's what the current methods can do. Okay, so now I'm going to introduce you to our model organisms. Uh, so here we have E. coli, and then we have three species of Pseudomonas. So if you all think back to our bio taxonomy classification, uh, Pseudomonas is oh, my bad. Pseudomonas is the genus, and then we have three species within that genus. P. aeruginosa, P. nitroreducens, and P. syringae. So these are all types of bacteria. To prepare these samples for analysis, our collaborators culture them overnight in these flasks. Um, P. syringae does better at room temperature in the lab, and then the others are cultured in an incubator at 37 degrees Celsius. OK, so then I get the samples. Uh, the VOCs are in the headspace right here. To sample from this headspace, we use a adsorbent tube loaded with a material, 10XTA. 10XTA is just really good at absorbing um, semi-volatile and volatile materials. 
We use this to concentrate vol the volatiles released by the bacteria because bacteria release volatiles at very low concentrations. So pre-concentrating is necessary to detect them. To analyze the VOCs, we use mass spectrometry. Um, so we connect our tube to the mass spec chamber. We heat the tube to desorb volatiles and then analyze those volatiles with mass spec. Because we're ultimately interested in developing a method that can be deployed on a spacecraft, we have to use an instrument that can easily be deployed on a spacecraft. So as mass spectrometers, I'm sorry guys. <laughs> as mass spectrometers go, this one is pretty small and has lower power demand, so it can easily be integrated into spacecraft operations. Okay, so goal number one was to evaluate reproducibility. To do this, we collected spectra from three different cultures for each species. So here we have some of that spectra. Um, right here, these are all peaks that are representing VOCs that have been detected by the mass spec. The different colors are indicating the different replicates. Um, and this is all E. coli data. Okay, so as you can see, there are definitely peaks that are showing up every time, but then there are also peaks that are showing up in some cultures and not others. Um, so we can use this to identify what peaks we detect consistently every time we look at E. coli. And this is going to serve as our indicator. We did this for uh, each of the Pseudomonas species as well. OK, so if we have a reliable indicator, we need to know if we can tell it apart from the other species. We started with the easy one, E. coli and the Pseudomonas. So here we have an overlay of E. coli volatiles and P. aeruginosa volatiles. E. coli is the black, and P. aeruginosa is the blue. And so we do have some similarities, but we also have some differences. So we ran a PCA where we pooled all of the pseudomonas data um, and tried to separate it from the E. coli data. So pseudomonas over here, E. coli is over here. Um, and so we were successful in clustering out the two groups of bacteria. Um, so this was pretty exciting. And it also affirms that we do have some consistency <coughs> in um, the volatiles we're detecting because we included uh, data from each of the replicates um, in these PCAs. OK, so now for the hard one, the pseudomonas. Uh, so here we have spectra of each of the pseudomonas species. Uh, and I'll show the overlay. And as you can see, these have a lot more in common than E. coli and uh, P. Uh, so we ran a PCA again. And honestly, this was way better than I expected to go. <laughs> we were able to separate P. syringae from P. aeruginosa and P. nitroreducens. Uh, we unfortunately weren't able to separate out the P. aeruginosa and P. nitroreducens, but I think this is a really great first step. Um, this is consistent with a lot of the papers we're seeing in the literature. Um, but because we want to be better, um, we are looking into uh, more advanced ways that we can process this data. Okay, so moving forward, uh, we're working with some machine learning techniques to uh, finish up our identification of the pseudomonas species. As I said earlier, bacteria emit VOCs at very low concentrations, so we're also always looking um, at advanced pre-concentration methods to improve the sensitivity of our measurement. Kind of wrap things up, we were able to identify some consistent patterns of VOCs that can serve as an indicator for E. coli and our three pseudomonas species. We were able to dis use these indicators to distinguish between the E. coli and the pseudomonas, um, and distinguish P. syringae from P. aeruginosa and P. nitroreducens. So thank you guys for listening. And so um, you know the uh, the issue with sensitivity seems like it can be a big uh, problem, but you know a place like the ISS has um, air circulation that I'm sure is modeled and understood fairly well, right? Because it's being controlled by you know, all these different mechanisms. I would imagine you might be able to then probably um, use some sort of VOC collection uh, uh, swab or, or you know, uh, thing that sticks out and, and basically grabs all those. Have you considered using something like that or um, with the amount of effort required to you know, take a swab and then uh, you know, put it into a mass spectrometer and do those analyses, would that preclude you from you know, making it this simple? Yeah, so you could definitely kind of conduct this method with sampling. Um, I think another issue that you're going to run into if you do this on the ISS is that there are dozens of species of bacteria and dozens of species of fungi on the ISS, so you're likely to collect samples with multiple species. 
those are all going to interact and have effects on the volatiles that they produce. So that's something that you have to understand before you were going to like do any kind of sampling um, and before you were going to put a method like this on the ISS. Thanks. Thanks. Um, first of all, super cool project. Love seeing some space biology here today. Um, and also, I was just curious. So, for the differences in the different strains, do you know if there's um, any specific compound or feature that might be explaining those key differences? Yeah. So, I'm gonna go back. Um, so, E. coli, a really nice identifier was this guy. Um, I think this is ethanol. Um, and that was detected in the E. coli, but not so much in the pseudomonas. So, that was really nice. For the pseudomonas, um, if you take a quick look at the ovite, don't get too long, I'll give you a headache, but um, <laughs> we didn't really detect any peaks that were only showing up in one and not the other. But what was kind of nice is that we, I think what the PCA is picking up on is that the ratios of peaks are different. Um, so like all of them have this peak here, which is like indicative of dimethyl disulfide. But if you look at the ratios of the other peaks to the dimethyl disulfide peaks, those are consistently different. Um, and so I think that's what's allowing us to kind of separate out some of these. Thank you. Hi, cool talk. Um, I was wondering if uh, you've, and I know you said your collaborators were growing bacteria, but have you considered looking into how the growth phase of bacteria affects the POC profile? <laughs> yeah, we actually um, pretty early on did an experiment where we tried to compare exponential phase to stationary phase. But unfortunately, during the exponential phase, the population was too low that we couldn't detect anything. Um, so maybe if we're able to develop like some more, like better pre-concentration techniques, we would want to go back and revisit that. Yeah, great question. You touched on this just a bit ago, but um, I was wondering, like, so do you think that uh, that uh, measuring, uh, that if you get a measurement that is a mixture of multiple things, do you think you can pull out which ones are there, or they're going to, is there going to be is, is there going to be interactions, or do the or does the, some of them look too much like something else, or or what? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, and honestly, I don't know. Um, We've done some like VOC analysis before where we look at like mixtures of like materials off gassing. Um, and those were cool because they were really additive, like you know, just the two signatures together. Because microorganisms can interact with each other though, I, I'm not really sure how that's gonna go, if there's any gonna be like different compounds because the environment has changed. So that'll definitely be something that worth looking into. Awesome. Thank you, Sarah. Next up, we have our last talk of this section, which is uh, George McCabe, and she will be discussing microbial genomic modification along deep sea salinity gradients. My name's Jordan, and today I'm going to be talking about how microbes can modify their genomes as you go down deeper in a deep sea anoxic basin. So Claire gave an awesome introduction a few talks ago about what Orca Basin is. Um, it's essentially just a salty lake at the bottom of the ocean. It's about 300 kilometers south of the coast of Louisiana and covers an area that's about 15, or sorry, 150 square kilometers. Um, it formed by dissolution of these evaporitic deposits that can be upwelled by salt tectonics. And um, these salt deposits date back to the Jurassic era. Um, and as it dissolves into the water, it's very dense, so it sinks into the bottom, and you end up with this very salty sea pit. It's about seven times saltier than seawater and is sodium chloride dominated. And just to get ahead of the question, there are no actual orcas there, unfortunately. It's just the name. 
<laughs> so I went there on research cruise this summer as part of the Oceans Across Space and Time team. So OST is generally interested in understanding how ocean worlds and the things living inside them can co-evolve. And this can result in signals indicating past or present life. So broadly, we're interested in looking at the limits of life, particularly in very salty environments. And this is generally done by looking at microbial identities, activity, and metabolism. Um, we're also looking at different technologies that we can use to study such environments in natural biological contexts. So the goal of Orca Basin, this cruise, was to look at these extremophilic microbes as the conditions become progressively hostile towards life. So generally, it's very salty, it's anoxic, no oxygen. Um, there's a lot of nutrients that are lacking, but there's also a lot of toxic heavy metals. And it's just generally not a great place for most things to live, but there are some things found there. So the specific biological feature I was interested in is something called methylation. So DNA is not just the A's, T's, C's, and G's that make up the genetic code. There's actually a variety of chemical modifications that can also be done to the DNA. One such thing is this methylation, which is just the addition of a methyl group onto a DNA base. And this basically functions like a molecular tag that can either prevent or enhance protein binding. And this allows things to adapt their um, genome in a way that's reversible and pretty rapid. It's a lot less lower stakes to have some thing that's kind of stuck onto the DNA instead of changing the genetic code itself. And over the past few years, a variety of different studies have characterized differential methylation patterns in response to different environmental conditions. So this has been seen in symbiotic versus free-living cells, um, the, as cells are starved of nutrients and then regain their nutrients, the age of the overlying sediment, and even space light. I'm studying this using something called biological nanopore sequencing, so MinION, um, and this enables long-read DNA sequencing and study of genomic modifications such as methylation. So this is a little bit different from standard DNA sequencing technologies. Generally, what you would have to do is take your DNA and chop it up into a bunch of little pieces and then make copies of that. When you make those copies, it does not conserve those modifications such as methylation. So if you're using something like the MinION, you're able to get into what those modifications actually are and see them within the genome. Also, you can chop up the pieces and do the amplification if you want to, but it's not required. Um, and when, also, when you have these longer strands, you are able to get a better sense of where within the genome these different genes are, and you can kind of get a better sense of what role this plays in the organism overall. It also is useful for sequencing DNA in resource-limited environments. For example, it's been done in the Antarctic Dry Valleys, um, in the International Space Station, as Sarah mentioned in her presentation, and even on a research cruise. So I was able to get some samples and take that from sampling to actually doing sequencing in the span of a few hours, so I could do some preliminary analysis on the boat. So yeah, back to the research cruise. We were at sea for two weeks above the RV Point Sur, and we collected samples using this CTD outfitted with a rosette of Niskin bottles. So we were able to snap these bottles closed at different depths and then also use the sensors to get correlated geochemical data. And here you see some very happy grad students collecting our samples. <laughs> So we were at, collecting at various locations throughout the um, northern and the southern lobes. I particularly focused on P1 and P5. So right here, I took samples from six depths. And I'm not going to be talking about these samples anymore for the rest of this presentation, but just wanted to indicate that they're there. I use this mostly for testing and optimization. Um, I also collected seven depths from P5. And this is what I'll be carrying through into the analysis and what I'll be talking about for the rest of the study. To give an example, or a perspective, really, on where within the depth profile these samples were collected from, this is um, just percent transmission with depth, so really just how much light is going through a sample. And as you can see, it's pretty boring for most of the water column, but then towards the bottom, you get some very interesting peaks. So this is the area that we chose to focus on for this specific cast, and this is going to be a kind of big targeted effort through some different people on the cruise to compare our analyses at this level. So this area right here, this percent transmission, is just this red box but zoomed in. And I also have a few different other parameters, salinity, dissolved oxygen, temperature, pH. The salinity is the thing that I'm most interested in because you really do see this kind of change in the gradient. Oh, and also all of these uh, black squares are where I took my samples from along these transects. The dissolved oxygen drops off pretty quickly within this level. And the temperature and the pH, um, it's pretty cold, but it's not crazy for what we know things to be able to withstand. And the pH is hanging out around neutral. So to talk about what I do with my samples, um, I collected them on the boat. And for min-ion sequencing, you need a pretty high biomass input. So you need about 1,000 nanograms of DNA or a little bit less, depending on what strategy you're using. And for people who work with DNA, you'll know that's kind of a lot. 
especially if you're in a resource limited low biomass environment such as the open ocean. So I use a few different concentration methods to take four liters of sample down into about 200 microliters for each of my dots. And this was able to enable some DNA concentration um, for my progressive extractions. So the next step, once I brought it back to the Georgia Tech lab, was to do those DNA extractions. And this is a very bare bones depiction of what is a really long process to extract the DNA. Essentially, you take the cells and you put it in a lysis buffer in a tube with some beads. You shake it up, this basically cracks the cells open to get the DNA out, and then you do a series of chemical washes and purification steps. So here are the results for my DNA extraction. Um, really, the only thing you need to know is that I got enough for my sequencing. Um, you need about 400 nanograms per sample for the particular approach I was choosing, but you can make lower amounts work. So for almost all of my depths, I got plenty. I got a little bit less than 400 for my deepest, saltiest sample, but like I said, it's, it's workable. And this also may be a function. Um, it could be for due to a few different things, either cell density or the presence of a few chemical species that were interfering with some of my DNA extractions. So they're currently stored in the fridge in a cell fixative, and I'll be sequencing them hopefully in the next couple of weeks, so stay tuned. Um, and what I'll be doing with those once I do the sequencing, um, so I'll be using a minion barcoding ligation-based approach. Basically what that means is to adapt the DNA for the nanopores inside the minion sequencer. I'll be adding on some molecular fragments, and this is just like a molecular adapter. I'll also be adding on barcodes, which are different IDs within the molecules that are unique to each sample, so that I can pull everything and sequence it all in one go. I'll also be able to look at this methylation information. So like I said earlier, um, with DNA amplification, this does not preserve those molecular tags. So what I'll do is I'll take a small amount of DNA and I'll amplify it, and then I'll kind of have like a negative control sample for methylation detection. And I can sequence the unmethylated amplified DNA along with the um, raw unaltered DNA. And then basically the differences in the signal will indicate the presence of methylation or other molecular features. <coughs> So next up, as I said, I will do that minion sequencing. This will allow us to get an idea of the general taxonomy of this area and maybe disentangle what sort of functional things exist here. I will make those comparisons to and for methylation. And generally, this is hoped to just help reveal how microbes can specifically modify their genomes under these very extreme environmental conditions. And generally, we hope to add to the growing body of knowledge of how, how things can not only survive, but also persist in different extreme environments. Um, with that, I just wanted to thank people who helped make this work possible, including the crew of the RV Point Sur research crews, um, my group, the Planetary Exploration Lab, and the OST team. Thank you. Great question. Um, so I am not totally sure what specifically I might see that's methylated within the genome, but I do expect that there will be some sort of differential in where that methylation is spread. And um, once I do that, I'll be able to kind of look at the associated genes and make some hypotheses. But I would assume that there could be maybe some sort of adaptation that is helping with the low oxygen and high salt conditions of this environment. Well, there are no more questions. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you. So we will now take a break until 11.30, and we'll have our first keynote speaker of the day, Dr. Jill McCookie. So, yeah. All right. And we'll be back at 11.30.
about today is I just wanted to highlight um, my experiences working in the cryosphere over the past um, teen years and how that has um, integrated me with some of these uh, astrobiology um, analog missions. 
I'd really like to thank my hosts and all the Explorer Origins fellows for having me here. Dinner last night was really inspiring and fun. And Sarah and Chad for all your organization um, and help uh, throughout this. So thank you. All right, so I'm going to explain how cryosphere environments, um, in my opinion, can inform um, astrobiological studies, how they can serve as analogs. I'll try to highlight just a few of some of the features, give a few um, example expeditions that I've been involved with, and then I'm going to muse a little bit about extremophiles. I don't think I'm going to get into some of the briny stuff I've been doing that much lately because that would go over time, but please come see me in one of the breaks if you're interested in the brine stuff. So this audience is well informed. I wanted to put a caveat, I think I did somewhere. I am a terrestrial scientist, so I really I get a lot out of your talks for folks who actually work on Mars and some of these other planetary systems. But the way I approach it is thinking about the universe as a very cold place. Um, I get really excited about these ocean worlds that have liquid waters below their ice shells because that's kind of the space that I operate in here on Earth. And that's the cryosphere. And so this um, is many portions of our planet. The vast majority of our planet, too, is pretty cold. If you think about temperatures below 4 degrees, I know it's not that cold because it's like a refrigerator, but it, is, it, is, it still, still does affect life as a low temperature. Um, and so we have permafrost, um, sea ice, lake ice. Um, we're really concerned about these more lately because they're um, rapidly changing. Um, oops, I just turned it off. Okay, um, it's like right next to the right hand thing. <laughs> um, but cold terrestrial ice in particular is really important for preparations for some of these um, astrobiological missions. And of course, that would be in Greenland and Antarctica. There's all sorts of challenges to get there, but these are still pretty critical places to study. So what are some of the analog type features that we have? I can probably even stand this far over here and like look at that one, and this room is fantastic. Um, one of my favorite sites is uh, subglacial lakes, and these provide us with hundreds of mini ocean world laboratories. Um, you can imagine what I, what I loved about some of the talks today is talking about the, the diversity of niche space that Mars potentially has. And when I think of subglacial worlds, I think of the same thing, not just as like ice over land, but that there's a potential for high ecological diversity as well. The current global inventory is over 700 lakes, both in Antarctica, Greenland, and in more temperate settings. Um, there's evidence of a hypersaline subglacial lake below Devil, Devon Island. That could There is some dispute over um, what the imagery um, suggests, whether it's a lake or not, but there's still value in figuring out what that um, signal entails. And I assume elsewhere there are hypersaline subglacial features as well. Um, such as Blood Falls, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, there's Caldera Lake, so these volcanically linked um, subglacial systems, as well as some of these very large, deep, um, closed basin lakes in the Antarctic that we have yet to tap into yet um, that have significant sedimentary deposits for us to study. There's also these unique ice um, transition zones, which could potentially be hot spots for either the accumulation of materials, um, biotic or otherwise. So these might be places you'd be interested in targeting if you are going to go to an ocean world. Um, these would be places like uh, you guys are probably really familiar with this. Dr. Brittany Schmidt and her Iceman robot has been able to explore some of these regions, bringing back some really um, incredible first ever images. But as some of this platelet ice forms, it will incorporate material from the surrounding ocean water, um, and that will help nucleate some of these crystals, and you will um, incorporate uh, microbial cells or other um, particulates. So that could be a fun hot spot as well as grounding zones. So this is where the ice starts to lift off from um, the continent and interacts with the ocean water. And so this is where you could have some significant mixing of potential like ecotone. There's also what we call weathering crusts or fern aquifers. So these are places within the interior of the ice sheet where water might accumulate on an ice lens, perhaps below the fern and where the ice starts to form. And you'll accumulate a variety of materials, cells, and liquids, again, when you're looking for a needle in a haystack, maybe finding where um, the hot spots might be is a potentially good target. And these features, um, folks are really working hard to better be able to identify these with some of the technologies we have with ice penetrating radar, where these liquid features in ice might be. 
On um, the really small scale, um, you have cells, microbial cells that are collected within ice cores that then interact with that ice process, whether they were involved in nucleating the snow that formed uh, or fell and helped form the glacier ice, or whether they just got squeezed out into the veins in the ice core themselves. And when these cells are incorporated into ice, it, they can also interact with it, whether they're forming um, ice nucleating proteins or antifreeze proteins, and they could potentially alter the structure of that ice, whether it's sea ice or ice core ice. So you have this potential for like icy biofabrics at the microscopic level. Um, so uh, how do these unique features potentially inform ocean world exploration? So this is where I get at my depth and I start to imagine things like, okay, this idea of cryovolcanism where you have um, uh, sub sub-ice ocean water pushing through um, cracks in an ice cover and then spewing out its contents onto the surface. On Earth, we actually don't have that many features that um, go from the subsurface to the surface. Most um, liquid and other materials are collected on ice surfaces and then drain through to the bottom. And so it's kind of like a hunt to find where um, some of these um, features might exist to provide this analog that we need. And so this is like my new favorite. This is a glacial volcanic fumarole system um, in Canada. It's called Mount Meager. And I don't know if you can see here, that's a person. Um, and then this is some steam coming out. That's called Big Bertha is what they decided to nickname that. But it's actually a cave system that starts up here and um, comes back out here. And this is from fumaroles heating up this ice and carving out these, um, these caves. You've also got these kind of um, large crevasses over here. And so maybe this can be used as an analog to at least how to explore uh, fumarole-created caves and other um, really chaotic terrain on tops of glaciers. I mean, I've walked on a lot of different types of really cold ice and I've never seen features quite like this. And I was fortunate to be invited to participate in uh, the Mount Meager Volcano Project, which included folks from the NASA EELS team. It was supported by the Royal Canadian Geographic Society and the Trebek Initiative. Um, and it was cool because there was all these features. So you have these carved caves, you have this vapor coming out. So maybe you can look at the effects of vapor deposition on ice. You can explore a crevasse field and look at debris laden ice. So all of these little intricacies might inform some of your potential studies. And this is where I get really excited when you can integrate STEM terrestrial-based questions with planetary questions. And so you have robotic navigation of ice caves and sample acquisition that your um, engineers will want to test. Um, you have life detection that your astrobiologists will want to test, but also your terrestrial ecologists are really interested. These are very understudied communities. We know very little about um, fumarole-associated microbial communities, especially ones that may end up in that vapor phase. And we know a lot less about um, sulfitic fumaroles. This fumarole happens to um, emit a lot of hydrogen sulfide gas, most are CO2 based. Um, yeah, so you can link your engineering goals with your science goals, both um, astrobiological and terrestrial. So we were able to go and collect. This is us standing outside the cave trying to um, trap some of this vapor. Um, and so here's just some other pictures of us trying to collect samples. Um, we were successful in getting some of that. Um, hydrogen sulfide precipitated out. We were collecting these samples for method development and ground truthing. Of course, this was an unfunded project, so we were just trying to piece things together. Um, we also got to work with uh, Dr. Morgan Cable, who's absolutely fantastic, and she was able to test some of the instrumentation that are used on space missions. So this is her using her handheld near-infrared um, spectrometer, the TerraSpec Halo. It was also really great for a lot of really cool hero shots. This is like low end of what she was able to create for her Instagram or whatever it was. Um, so uh, yeah, it was spectacular. But uh, this is also instrumentation or techniques that are used on or proposed for the Mars 2020 and the SuperCam. And here's an opportunity yes, for, for us to test a system where we can ground validate um, the microbial component, the mineral component, with laboratory-based techniques and see how some of these instruments work. Um, there's also a lot of interest in navigating these challenging terrains, and this presents unique engineering challenges. When we were collecting these samples, we had to use expert cavers who were fully masked and who have navigated um, intense space to go in and collect samples for us. So we had to go and tell them what we wanted. It was, it was pretty impressive um, what they were capable of. 
Um, but ultimately, what you would want is this robot to be able to collect those samples for you. And so this provides a lot of different engineering scenarios for um, them to test this eel system. And so this is on Athabasca Glacier. They also took it to Mount Meager, but you can see they might use different components like the head, how do you deal with steam, how do you get through some of this terrain, et cetera. Um, so that's just kind of a preamble um, uh, for the eels. The other type of tools that I've been working with a lot recently are cryobots. And so cryobots is, I guess, the planetary way of talking about them. Melt probes is the way we talk about them in uh, glacier, glacier circles, but whatever, I'll mix it up because I think cryobot sounds kind of cool. And it's basically a simple technique that uses gravity and a heated tip to melt through the ice. Um, and they can address both planetary and terrestrial research aims. These are the kind of tools I like to work with. Um, you can use them in situ for analysis. If you can rig up your instrument with a payload, um, you could do sub-targeted sample acquisition and data analysis, which is kind of different than some of the other ways that we collect uh, in ice and drill through ice. Um, and then there's a lot of questions just about what's going on in that microenvironment around um, the MEL probe. Um, but one of the things that I love about it, working in remote areas, is it has a very limited logistical footprint. You can pack up an ice probe and maybe a sling load of a helicopter. Maybe you can stick it in interior. I got it in a full sling load. Um, but that's very different from like some of the larger subglacial lake drilling projects that use hot water drills I've been involved with, which I think, Chris, we were talking about how many pounds was it last time. I was like, astronomical, it was like 13 tractor trailers worth of gear that we carried with us. Um, so the Melt Probe I've worked a lot with, or the Cryobot, is called the University of Washington's Ice Diver. And it's modeled after the Filbert probe. This is um, a pretty old technology because it's pretty straightforward. I think it was from the 60s. It's just a hot point with a copper head. It was used to melt through the ice sheets, um, often a one-way journey, often to just get uh, information about maybe pressure and temperature at the base of an ice sheet. Um, and you can do various um, things with it, maybe putting with modern electronics, differential um, heating panels to kind of guide it. Um, the new version of the ice diver also has um, a jetting pump system for faster um, melting through ice. And we've been working extensively with the team at EPL for a water sampling port. So this would be allowing them to suck in a little bit of that melt jacket as it goes down at different locations. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how a microbiologist might play a role in support. I put supporting in air quotes because I don't do the technology development. I just, you know, it would be really nice if we could get a sample that wasn't contaminated or, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> and then uh, also, it's I like to tag along with these trips because it gets us into really um, places we can't get to otherwise. These tools are just so cutting edge. And I know for engineers, they call it a test. But for me, it's the thing. So that's been like the most exciting part about uh, collaborating that way, because it helps me advance um, my, the understanding that we have of some of these systems. Um, so we do laboratory and field-based tests in this melt probe, probe technology. A lot of our time in the early days was spent working on cleaning. So here's the ice mole. I'll talk a little bit about this. This is a German-based probe that was funded by the DLR, the German Space Agency. And here, um, some undergraduate students are cleaning it in a tent in Antarctica. Um, we're interested in whether we can clean the exterior prior to deployment. We're concerned about dragging of material with it as we go to um, collect samples. This is the ice mold team in Antarctica. And this is the ice diver, that APL ice diver that I'm going to talk mostly about um, in Washington. We deployed on the Eastman Glacier. So the goal of cleaning a probe is you want to reduce the bio load on the exterior and you want to identify any microbial passengers. I know the current NASA standard is uh, based on spore counts, but spore counts really don't tell you what's there. You know, you could have non-spore formers, you could have DNA, and it, the ID is what matters. You're a human doing a project. You are not going to be free of cells, but if you know what you're dealing with, what your enemy is, you have a better chance of knowing what your true sample is. Um, so we developed just a really simple cleaning protocol that used Tritonex and hydrogen peroxide because these are relatively non-toxic easy to take into the field and to execute a cleaning protocol. We um, modeled it after NASA swabbing techniques, so the wiping and swabbing, and we're able to like do kind of some semi-comparison because in the Antarctic, drilling into ice requires the same type of clean 
techniques that are similar in a way to planetary protection, right? There's a lot of differences, but there, there is some analogy there. We kind of like um, navigate the space in between. Um, and so with this method, we measured a variety of biomolecules at the surface, but ATP is one that's pretty straightforward to measure-ish. Um, if you talk to Chad. <laughs> so, um, but we looked at totally, you can see the dirty um, surfaces are all over the place because sometimes, I know this rarely happens, but sometimes there's a problem with the instrument and the engineers have to get in there and touch it. And then they're not always so clean necessarily. And so we got to reclean it. So the dirtiness can, the, dirtiness, the dirtier year was, oops, sorry. The dirtier year was when we had some problems with the instrument. And then um, the cleaner years were when we could clean it in the lab and it, it worked quite well. But this uh, dotted line here is the proposed NASA standard uh, for ATP on the surface. And these are really low um, measurements. And up here we just threw um, the sample that we collected. So we're near detection suggesting it's really critical that you clean the surface. Um, but that's on the surface, right? Once we deploy this instrument, it's like a whole different game. Um, as a probe descends through ice, um, it's going to pick up any debris or microbes that might be in there. Now, maybe you're not worried about that on a, another um, icy moon, but you might be if you're trying to get a profile, if you're trying to look at differences or flux or change or any of these things. So while it might not be microbes, it's analogous in a way. And so on Earth, we have significantly high concentrations on the superglacial zone. This is often where you find those large blooms of photosynthetic algae um, that are um, responsible for bio albedo and other changes. Um, uh, in the inglacial zone, you collect debris, um, particulates through time that can accumulate in the glacier, so it can be very dusty and varied. And then the basal ice right before you puncture into your subglacial target is often um, some of the higher density amounts of cells and maybe even closely related to what your target is. So, um, oh, this is, this is just an image I, I wanted to put up and show you how. This is that uh, Mount Meager site. Look, do you see how pink that is? It's all snow algae. It was just like super extensive. Um, so uh, they're abundant on these. Oh, I was trying to show a picture here of Caleb Schuler. So he's a recent PhD, he's now Dr. Schuler. Um, this is probably the, the most normal picture I could capture of him in the field. Um, so he was a lot of fun to work with, but he's now um, working at Charles River, La Charles River Laboratory. Um, but we use these test sites to kind of test this theory of whether or not we can get rid of particulates on a glacier. It also allows, the, uh, on a uh, mouth probe as you navigate through a glacier, it also allows students to um, do sampling of opportunity. And I threw this picture up because he ended up writing a paper on um, some of the life cycle dynamics of snow algae. So it was like a little bit of um, both just a sample of opportunity. Um, so what we did here to determine whether or not um, cells and material are dragged with um, the ice diver and whether or not we're able to collect a clean sample inside the melt probe. We used a variety of laboratory and field-based techniques. So we built um, pure ice blocks that were clean and doped them with microbial cells and other debris to like melt the diver through that. We deployed it in Easton Glacier trying to collect samples. We did a series of controlled um, dye tests with meltwater, stimulating meltwater jack trying to trace where different fluids that were generated might go um, and whether it ended up in the sample bag. And then ultimately, we took it to Summit in Greenland to test its depth sensitivity. And here we're all excited because we got to 100 meters depth, which I, which I think is about the deepest that a sample has been collected with a melt probe in ice. So that was fun and cold. Um, it was cool, but it was like al altitude sickness. So I just don't know where I fall with that. It was fine. Um, not the first couple of days, though. Okay, so the ice block scenarios. Uh, here you can see this is the clear ice. You might be able to see up here. Here's a zoomed in view. Um, we made a variety of different ice block inoculums. So these would be E. coli um, that we could uh, that were um, had a specific gene, so we could pick them out. Um, antibiotic resistant E. coli. Um, we had FITC beads, so these are just um, polychromide beads, so we could um, look at how maybe particulates of different sizes would change. We also threw algae, we threw all different sizes in here as well as dye. And then we would melt the diver through to look for a range of dynamics. 
And here's just a, a lot of data, um, but we were able to measure ATP, which would tell us about total cells as well as the colony forming units of this specific E. coli. So we could, you know, the water wasn't necessarily clean. But you can see, you can pick up as the, melt, as the ice diver is melting through and collecting samples for us in real time. In this scenario, we had the ice diver um, collect samples through the nose and pump it up to the surface. Um, you hit a spike when you go through these layers, and then it tapers off pretty quickly, and then you hit a spike again when the tail um, flange goes through, and then it levels off. So while you still have some issues, ultimately, if you can get some travel distance beyond a, a, a contaminant, if you will, you can collect a pretty clean sample. So that was our major conclusion from that. Um, Oh, and here's just a picture of the sampling system. Still a lot of challenges with sample acquisition, if anybody works with this. Um, pumping at depths is really challenging. Um, but we had two sterilized um, autoclaved bags, a forward bag and an aft bag. And we pumped uh, in Greenland from 100 meters depth, a small amount of sample, collected about 50 mils. Uh, I, I think the jury's still out on whether or not there was um, some some contaminant in there. We picked up a little bit of the dye that we had used, so we're, we still think that needs to be refined, but it shows it is a possibility. It just still needs a little bit of work. Um, our next goal is going to be under a PSTAR funded project, and this will be to take the ice diver to an even deeper target at about 250 meters in the Juno ice field. There's some radar evidence that suggests there's um, potential for two subglacial fluid bodies here below this temperate glacier. So these could be really dynamic, um, but they present great tar targets for us testing um, some of the technological fidelity of this uh, robot. And this is work that's now going to be led by Jake Schaefer and Jared Clance um, in, in my lab. And to kind of get our feet wet, we checked out the scene. We went to um, Juno at Echo Glacier this year and started scouting out and collecting surface samples to see what that surface contamination might be. In temperate glaciers, you have a lot more communication of your surface water with your bed, and so we're going to have a really challenging time deconvoluting whether or not you have a true subglacial system. And so we wanted to get some background data on, on the chlorophyll presence, and we're going to use chlorophyll as kind of a biomarker because you wouldn't expect chlorophyll in the subsurface actually photosynthesizing. It would be there if it was a contaminant traveled um, from the top. So I don't even know where I am at the time. I'll just talk. <laughs> Fine, I should just go over here and check. Oh, I'm doing kind of okay. All right. Um, so, yeah, this was a, um, a borehole that was drilled with hot water, and we were able to test. So, this was not with the ice diver yet, so we're excited to take that back next year. Um, but some of our targets, like when I hear some of these planetary talks, it you know, it's like the balance of like what's realistic versus what's the iterative steps involved. And like drilling all the way into the ocean and going to a hydrothermal vent might be like way future us. And so it's probably going to be a lot of like surface um, surveys first, right? Like we're doing on Mars, maybe some sniffing with like these really interesting volatile works. But I can imagine that we might be also able to melt down to some distance and maybe get something in the interior of the ice sheet where you have um, end glacial processes occurring. And so this might be something that's um, achievable along the way. And I get excited thinking about that because often um, these end glacial dynamics may be contributing um, portions of the ocean as well as uh, of the ice surrounding it. Um, so this brings me to my favorite field site, which is in the dry valleys of Antarctica. We were talking about this a little bit last night. Um, the vast majority of Antarctica is covered with ice, but there's about 1% um, of the continent that's ice-free. Um, so it includes these like permafrost and cold desert niches. Um, you can see here, this is the East Antarctic ice sheet in the back and the Trans-Antarctic Mountains here are kind of preventing the flow of ice, except for here, a lovely Taylor Glacier into this area. And this has long been used as a Mars analog site because it's one of the coldest, driest deserts on our planet. It gets extremely low precipitation um, and it's in the form of snow. Who knows what will happen in a warming world? Um, but it's, it's a really great place to work. Um, this is a really old school image of terrestrial biomes, but it, it shows that in terms of average annual temperature and precipitation, it falls closest to Mars. It was used, um, and I guess our only true life detection, I don't know, is that, is that controversial to say in this room? <laughs> only true life detection mission with the Viking landers um, uh, as test soil. 
to see if we could uh, get these instruments to work. Um, and so the sensitivity of the label release experiment, for example, was optimized using soils from the Wright Valley, uh, which is just adjacent to the Taylor Valley. So I thought that that was pretty cool. Um, but it's known uh, locally as the Valley of the Dead. This is because the early explorers that walk through these places. It's kind of desolate. It's really, really, really quiet unless it's windy. Um, and then there's a lot of carcasses all over the place, these really old seal carcasses. And they kind of pop up. You know, you're walking, they kind of, uh, you know, like pop up as you <laughs> or, 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 or whatever. So, oops, oh, I did it again. Um, and it's also home to, um, and including these dry soils and alpine glaciers, these really exotic brines that have just captivated me for the majority of my career. This is Blood Falls, and this is Don Juan Pond. Um, and so these features have defied life detection. I mean, for the vast majority of my PhD, I was told there was no life in the system, right? Um, to this day, we still don't know if Don Juan Pond hosts an active ecosystem. I'm, I'm always in the camp of probably. <laughs> it's just not the right tool yet, right? Um, but this is one of the few examples, Blood Falls is, is one of the few examples of where you actually have subglacial fluid pushing through the base of the glacier to the surface. And in this case, it's actually a brine and it's a, a highly concentrated seawater. So it presents this really interesting analog for at least targeting an glacial brine system, maybe targeting how material from an ocean survives once it hits the surface. Um, a lot of really interesting questions. And you can see synergies between how we do planetary and how we do terrestrial science. And I like to think of this like, where are you going to drill on this continent the size of US and Mexico? You know, your cryobot is like, what, two centimeters in diameter, right? So like, again, that needle in the haystack. Um, well, you, you're probably going to throw, go through some kind of aerial survey, right? You're going to go through scale. Maybe you'll um, send a drone. Then maybe you'll send your little rover on your drill. Maybe you'll get a person or a rover to collect some actual samples, and then you can analyze those samples and look for cells, um, and then eventually maybe down to molecules. So all along the whole scale gamut, where you first ask, is there any liquid water? Where would it be? How can we find it? Can it reveal a potential habitat that's of interest? Is any of this liquid water accessible? Can we actually get at it? Um, I know there's always concern about uh, these uh, special regions, but is there a way to maybe uh, get to that, that you can actually sample it? And then can we detect our signs of life? So um, this is the same protocol that we go through in the Antarctic. Not necessarily in that order, but I'll try to tell it in that order. Um, so Blood Falls is about two and a half times the salinity of seawater. Um, it's a strong candidate for resistivity mapping. So using electromagnetics to um, look for saturated sediments. If this technology hadn't been applied in Antarctica before. It's used broadly to look for groundwater. But when we took it to the Antarctic, it actually performed quite well. And it was great at mapping groundwater in permafrost because you have highly resistive glacial ice, highly resistive permafrost, but then you've got um, the potential for both um, saturated and salty sediments. And so, of course, I was most interested in flying over Blood Falls. Um, and it was fantastic because Brian did show up like a beacon below this cold base glacier. And so this red purpley color is resistivity, highly resistive glacial ice. You can remove this with 3D modeling. This is done by the SkyTem work, uh, SkyTem folks and Neil Foley. Um, and you can see here, you've got this extensive brine below the glacier. It's um, about greater than the volume of water on all the surface lakes in the Dry Valley. So it's a significant amount of water. And it's also um, slowly moving into Lake Bonnie. And when we took this instrument, in addition to mapping Blood Falls, we mapped throughout the Taylor Valley all the way to the McMurdo Sound. And it was really surprising for me to see extensive groundwater in this polar desert where we only were looking at surface water features before. So I think this is a great way to look for saturated sediments and other things. You got that helicopter working in Mars now, like maybe a little, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know anything about technology, but maybe a little resistivity meter. I don't know. All right, um, I got to show Ariel's video here. She was an artist and writer down there. Um, and so this gives you a little bit of sense of what this feature is like, but you can see how it's really dynamic and it would be hard to just go up and, and sample it at these different locales. You got to kind of catch it at the right time. These are a lot of salts that are precipitating out 
around the feature. These are um, calcite and um, some uh, iron oxides that are precipitating out here on the surface. You see the moraine and the glacier terrain, and when it melts, you have a real kind of mixture. It's a lot to deconvolute once the material comes to the surface. Now, if you're able to get to the surface, I don't know if uh, this is close up standing on, on the site. I don't think you have any volume, but can you see that? Trust me, it was a really cold day this day, right? Like, extremely cold, even though it looks sunny, and my awful video camera is like, my hands are way too cold. But um, the fact that you have water flowing on this feature, up, uh, up, uh, there we are talking to them. Um, but the fact that we have water flowing at this time suggests that it's like a brine solution that is flowing. And so when you're at the surface there, you can, you know, sometimes it's just glacial melt that's mixing with that, um, that precipitate at the surface. And it could look like it's flowing because it's just darker in color. And so it's just causing the ice around it to melt. Or it could actually be flowing. And if you can collect that flow, it's clear. Um, it's not turbid. It's um, highly saline. It's also reducing. It's void of oxygen. It's circumneutral. It's sub-zero. It's about minus seven when you sample it. Um, it's got a diversity of iron. Um, most of the iron ends up in these precipitates, but there's DNA-containing cells and measurable metabolic activity. So it's a really interesting feature, and I've been spending way too much of, well, I guess it's been a pleasure to spend a lot of my career um, studying this feature in particular. Um, this is a very busy slide, but this is the part of the talk where I just threw on slides after seeing all your inspiring <laughs> talks. So I apologize in advance, but um, Eli Sklu was mentioned earlier, and I've been fortunate enough to work with her as well. And so she brought some of her instruments. She threw the book at Blood Falls. She's like, we need to characterize this surface stuff. And I'm like, yeah, because I was I'm just always trying to get into the subsurface. And so um, characterizing the surface features, these materials that we collected, she used XRD, she used FTIR, she used Raman, she used um, her Mossbauer. And the Mossbauer rules out all iron hydroxides. Uh, the Raman identified carbonate species, but not iron hydroxide. I mean, it was, again, like this thing I have, just really frustrating. Like, I know there's iron there. Um, <laughs> but not by the techniques that she was using, so I thought that was interesting. We had to take it to the lab and analyze it using um, electron microscopy, and it was there that we noted um, some abundant amorphous iron-rich nanospheres. And so it was a kind of a cautionary tale um, that this color appears to be the result of um, both the, um, the calcite molecules or minerals as well as the oxidation of dissolved iron from the subglacial fluid, but that it forms these amorphous iron-rich nanospheres. And it suggests the limitations of um, direct observations, right, and some of these instrumentations and having really good samples and, and really maybe interrogating some of these analog sites with the instruments, as, as many as you can here on Earth. Um, so you need these multiple complementary techniques. It also suggests some potential challenges for sample return, right? These were samples that were in my freezer that I tried to preserve in the best way that I could. I think of Mars 2020 and those canisters sitting at the surface for um, a long time, and I'm like, ugh. <laughs> 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 I mean, my freezer's bad enough, because like, <laughs> keeping the power on at UT apparently is not an easy thing to do. <laughs> um, so yeah, so analog uh, feature. Uh, what about the surface, right? Because this subglacial fluid really, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about the subglacial fluid, but at the surface it really changes. So if I'm collecting samples at the surface, I know they're not the subsurface samples. They have maybe some elements, but they're not completely representative. And so it's a dr dramatic transition. You go from anoxic to oxic. You dissolve all your gases. So this is where you call on your engineer friends, say, hey, can you build me a robot that will get into this conduit? Um, and you work with your geophysical friends who can conduct a survey and say, hey, you know, this aquifer, while extensive, we could drill 500 meters through the glacier, or we could target the conduit in which it comes through, which, you know, comes near the surface. And so we were able to detect um, the presence of this conduit. Um, it was pretty discreet. And we drilled into about 17 meters um, with a version of a cryobot called the ice mole. Um, and again, we were able to clean out the surface. I'll let... Um, Giro, he was the lead engineer, um, describe how this works. Plus, I just like this video. Are there any 
Can you hear that? Which is powered by electric motor and creates the force the head needs to melt the ice, and so we have constant contact with the ice. By that way, we have a melting channel and move through the ice. Uh, here at Blood Falls on the Taylor Glacier, there's also like here's the Saturnian Mountain, there's a brine fill, so a salty water filled crevasse where we want to drive to and melt through to the ice to this crevasse. To, to extract the sample from there. So we have this small proboscis on the tip of our melting probe, which we can extend, and which takes up the sample inside the ice wall and pumps it also to the surface. So um, that was a project that we were able to complete. Um, ooh, let me see if I can get, yeah, get forward. And so it was able to, one thing that was novel about that probe was the screw tip on the end, which gave it some torque. Um, we also had some sensors on the tip that allowed us to measure conductivity. As we moved in, I was also measuring conductivity at the surface. And this was a really great contrasting feature, right? Glacial ice versus hypersaline fluid. So we knew when we were getting into the conduit chemically as well. Um, and so we were able to suck up some sample from about 17 meters depth in the end glacial conduit and collect samples and found that um, samples that I collected at the surface in 2004 were almost identical. This is just a heat map showing um, community abundance. Um, and so it doesn't even matter what the species are. I can talk to you about that, what they are. But they're very different between surface collected features or times when there's not an outflow. So the, the take home lesson is here is that um, the subglacial feature is stable over decades, which is fascinating. Um, there's a high variation once the material comes to the surface, and that makes sense. And the surface life is dominated by chloroplasts, so photosynthetic communities taking advantage of some of those subglacial nutrients. Um, but getting samples outside of your target site over many years is also really important to kind of convolute this work. I don't know what that extra E is doing there. But I tried to make a last minute edit. All right, now I have to check how I'm doing on time. I've got like, what, five more minutes? All right, so let's see how I can blow through some of these uh, <laughs> um, I'm getting near the end. So it's rare that we can go to Antarctica. Um, I've been fortunate enough to go many, many times, um, but it's still, you, you can't get a lot of material. It's still very challenging, um, and sometimes you're not always successful. So my lab group also spends a lot of time trying to cultivate organisms from these systems. So we have something to work with for hypothesis building, for maybe testing instruments, um, for asking new questions. And so these are just two of um, the more photogenic ones that we've been able to get. This is um, Galetus murea. It's a new species that we were able to characterize. Um, Merinobacter are actually pretty dominant in the Dry Valley brines. Um, this one was found in um, a brine sample collected both with the um, ice diver and with some hand collected samples. This Shuanella species, um, which is really like, wow, look at this guy, that, that flagella is just next slide. It's just a great image of it. But this organism was collected um, near the surface. Um, and so some projects that we've had, this is um, some work of Jake Schaefer, a PhD student in my lab who's um, near completion. Um, but he had some questions about whether or not we can um, make assumptions about what is abiotic versus um, biotic at the surface. That's um, very much the goal. I still think it's a big challenge. And so he used the Shuanella to see, as an example, if we could detect environmentally relevant biosignatures using isolate incubation experiments. And so in this experiment, we tried to look at the combination of some difference in changes to iron mineralogy because this Shuanella species um, is capable of uh, breathing iron, so it can use iron-3 as an electron acceptor. Um, and whether or not that correlates to some of the volatile organic compounds that this microbe um, produces, and then if we can confirm this both mineral um, component and um, the volatile component to the Shuanella. And it's a, it's a really challenging thing to do. Um, Sarah and I were talking about it, so it's an incomplete story. Um, but for our experiment, we were collaborating with Peter Lee at the College of Charleston, and we were using PTRMS to measure headspace volatiles of both environmental samples and the Shuanella grown under different conditions with live cells, dead cells, um, you know, media blank, and lab air. And so we had these large headspace vials set up. And we were able to at least show that our live cultures differ from not only um, blanks, but also cultures with no cells present. 
And we were able to look at some of the mineralogy produced. Um, the Shuanella produces some magnetite as well as some other um, reduced species as it grows. And we were able to combine this and look at some of the headspace um, volatiles that were produced during this process. Not a lot of differences. Um, again, I think this is maybe the difficulty of how we were trying to ship these samples. Uh, but we were able to measure uh, DMS was um, significantly produced. We think this is DMS significantly um, higher in our live treatments with iron than our live treatments with no iron or any of our controls. So that may be some kind of signal that we're seeing there. And we were also able to use transcriptomics to show that this pathway was overexpressed in our iron treatment. So again, multiple lines of evidence, still a lot of work to do to kind of tie this story together. Um, but it gets us interested in these isolates that we collect um, from the site to see what they can teach us about molecular diversity across these landscapes. So volatiles is one type, DNA is another type, but there's um, a variety of different molecules that microbes use to communicate with each other, just like Sarah was telling about how important these volatiles are. And we're curious not just about um, terrestrial astrobiological biomarker signatures, but this idea of um, environmental change and sensitivity. And so what are some of the potential um, molecules we might look for? And so this led us to look at um, microbial secondary metabolites, which are organic compounds that are not involved in normal growth and development, but are involved in communication, responding to environmental change, um, they're not synthesized directly involved with central metabolism. They have really diverse functions like compatible solutes for dealing with high salt or um, low temperature, um, such as ectoine, or for communication um, molecules like your homoserine lactone, or antibiotics for microbial defense or other forms of communication. And so while these might be known to us as molecules that might serve us, they also provide some really important environmental functions as well. And I won't get into the story in detail, but this is a new NSF project that we have. Um, and we've been combing through these isolates. And each one of them produces its own array of these, or has the potential to produce its own array of these um, secondary metabolites. And so currently, we're working on um, field-based techniques to uh, see under what conditions these are expressed. And we're finding that growing them under low salt and high salt, for example, show completely different expression patterns, even in the same microbe. So it's, um, there's a lot of potential there, I think, for uh, really cool indicator molecules. OK, so I think I'm at the end. I'm closing up with my closing remarks. And then, of course, some extra slides, because you ever really close up after closing remarks. <laughs> um, so here's awesome diversity of analogs. I hope I've convinced you. Obviously, there's no perfect analog, but there's really um, interesting little niche features. Um, and there's so much to learn, so there's really a lot of synergy, and there's a sense of urgency in working across your environments as we lose them. So really teaming up, um, you know, using astrobiology as a lens to understand our changing world is critical. Um, there's a lot of work to be done to understand these um, uh, extreme files, both in the lab and in situ. Um, I'm excited about secondary metabolites as well as volatiles. And um, keep cultiva cultivating from these samples that you get. Um, even the heterotrophs are uh, interesting. So. And this is my last bit of closing thoughts. How much time do I have? A minute? Okay, all right, all right, I'm almost done. I guess I, I was thinking last night that I, I, was, I was talking to a bunch of graduate students, many of whom are about to embark off on what they're going to do. Some of them feel like they've been studying amino acids their whole life, or <laughs> maybe doing a lot of different things and mixing it around. So I thought about my journey, and I started looking at Blood Falls um, as a master's student. I saw a picture of it. And I never could let it go. I was in a geology class. Um, I wasn't doing Antarctic research at the time. But I found my way there, probably through sheer annoyance and will. <laughs> <laughs> but I couldn't stop thinking about it. And at the time, I couldn't tell you why I couldn't stop thinking about it. So there's something that just really you can't stop thinking about it. There's something there. And it was considered a little bit of a, um, you know, I, I definitely heard comments in the room back in the day about, oh, it's just an anomaly. It's just a weird feature. We don't care about it. But since I've been able to use this as this tool to communicate and collaborate and um, lure people into it, <laughs> sometimes because people find it so really interesting, so I can, you know, hey, um, do you want to think about this? Uh, I've been able to learn so much about the, the dry valleys, but also about Antarctica. And that resistivity mapping survey that I told you about revealed 
extensive groundwater systems throughout the Dry Valley region. It was incredible. Yeah, this map was a Taylor Valley, but we found um, a diversity end member closed basin systems. Don Juan Pond is a closed basin system with um, 75 meters of groundwater below it. Um, Subglacial and subpermafrost aquifer systems. Connectivity to the Ross Sea. If even just a little bit of Blood Falls water is leaking out into the ocean, it's dripping out iron and silica in really high concentrations. This has really significant um, importance to their ocean communities that may be nutrient limited. And so understanding how um, these two rare sites where this groundwater actually leaks to the surface, ironically, Blood Falls that I've been thinking about for years in Don Juan Pond, um, it's like this portal into the subsurface world and also maybe a, a sense of what the groundwater is like in Antarctica. And for decades, it's only been recently that we even thought groundwater had Antarctica. And now that there's more deeper surveys elsewhere, we realize it's probably pretty extensive. Um, these rock water interactions can be these subterranean estuaries. And I would just argue that it's really an important um, scientific priority. It's a priority for the Antarctic community to understand these systems and their impact on um, the blue economy, which is our, our global southern ocean that um, that Chilean sea bass you may have enjoyed last night probably <laughs> came from Antarctic cod off the coastal waters, right? So, um, yeah, so I just think there's um, uh, oftentimes these small little um, things that um, you can't let go of um, can fit into a bigger puzzle piece, um, and that can be really rewarding. Um, and maybe, and maybe, maybe someday it'll form us about like all these really cool features you guys were talking about earlier today, um, how ecosystems retreat to the subsurface and what that means. So with that, I would like to thank all the really fantastic, amazing people that I have the privilege of working with and collaborating with over time. And I will just leave you with some field pic pictures and take some questions if you have any. Thank you. Still, we have time for questions. First one I saw is over here. Um, I really enjoyed the presentation. Um, the, 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 I know you've worked with DLR and that kind of stuff, but with those probes you guys have been developing, have there any, been any considerations to adapting this for uses on, usage on other uh, Mars or moons, or have you just been solely focused on terrestrial applications for now? Um, I think that's a great question. So the, the motivation on the engineering end, I think, is the uh, ocean world potential, right? So with the DLR, they were really interested in acoustics, and most of their funding came from um, this pinger system that they were trying to use to understand where the probe was in ice, which is actually very challenging once it goes below the ice. It's very difficult to see. On the US end, with the ice diver folks, I would say they're equally as motivated to get into some of these deeper subglacial lakes that are under four kilometers of ice because of the logistical constraint of drilling into them with the fuel system that we have. Um, you know, the way of hot water drilling is really fuel intense. You gotta put a lot of gasoline in to melt. Um, it just doesn't seem feasible to really explore the ecological diversity of these lakes. So I think there's, um, I think there's equal motivation on both ends. I, I know less about how far um, the cryobot technology um, our motivation is or funding in that area, but I bet you there's folks in the room who can speak to that. But I think, you know, the fact that a P-Star using a cryobot was funded might... Uh, does that get at your, your question? I guess, uh, have you, uh, I guess so far, with your, in the place of your lab, have you guys fun thought to that or just... You, like, oh, what, what I think is more important? Or, or at least have you just been, like, um, most of your research so far has just been focused on making this work for my Antarctica and stuff, and, like, not, like, worried about... Um, oh, uh, um, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, that's why I ended with Antarctic groundwater. Like, I'm definitely motivated by uh, understanding the Antarctic system, right? That's what drives me. Um, do, there is such a big difference, I think, in the type of ice and the conditions that you would see on an ocean world that it's kind of hard to, to marry the two. Do I think that some of the Earth-based stuff we do can inform um, what they do, absolutely, but I'm definitely more focused on uh, getting some, some data now because, uh, you know, students need papers. And stuff like that. <laughs> um, that was a tough question. That was a good question. Um, yeah, I, I have bias. <laughs> Thank you so much for such an awesome talk. Oh, um, I'm a huge fan of snow and ice, and also now a microbiologist, so this is very exciting to me. 
Um, one of the questions I wanted to ask you about is you started this conversation uh, with a little bit of discussion about how microbes might be interacting with different um, ice structures. Mm. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that and if you noticed in any of these brine samples, if you've done any structural ice to brine to microbes and, and, and things like that, if you could explain that at all. That's a fantastic question. I don't know if the um, if Jen Glass is still here. I know her group does a lot of the clathrate binding proteins, which I was like, oh, like that stuff is so cool. So there, um, there, there must be some element of that. We've we've looked for like the presence of ice binding proteins in terms of rigorous studies on that. No, I would say that the Foreman Lab at Montana State does a lot more looking at how the microbe actually interacts with the ice matrix. Um, but what we've been doing with these isolates is looking for different tools that it might have to interact with this matrix, whether it's ice or it maybe some of these brines at the sediment, because binding to the sediment might be a better way than like floating freely in like this chaotropic brine, right? And so there we're looking at things like cis formation and extra polymeric substance um, production, which can also affect the structure of the, bind, uh, the um, sediment. How that translates into um, visually under the scope, um, that's a collaboration that we're doing with the Foreman group who has some of these techniques to look at how sediment and EPS form together, but then how that translates into like an actual biofabric that you can say, oh, yeah, that, no, that, that's wide open. But I think that it just fascinates me, I think, more so than me having any answer to it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I have kind of a more specific question about your radiovector isolate. I'm actually trying to isolate a radiovector from an oxygen emission zone. Um, and so I don't know if you know this, but they're kind of termed uh, biogeochemical opportunotropes, which is they're kind of just able to make a living in those saline environments. Um, but my question to you is, so they're kind of thought of like, oh, everywhere you look in a saline area, you're probably going to find them. Mm -hmm. I think um, with some of these isolates that are in these more extreme areas, did you see any like specific adaptations that were unique to that isolate? Oh, that's a good question because, uh, you know, I've been working with my collaborator, Leslie Ann Giddings, who is the natural products biochemist, and we're trying to look at like metabolites and, you know, she said it offhandly, but I, you know, it was deep, it was a deep thought. And she was like, Merino Bacter is just boring. Yeah. <laughs> it is, uh, you know, and so I don't know, I don't know the answer to that one. This one appears to be able to make gas vacuoles, what you would need with that under a subglacial setting. I don't know, it must have some other type of tree. I, I think we just don't know enough about what's in that, you know, unknown, protein of unknown function portion of the genome. But yeah, like how are they, I, I was actually just texting her about this last night. I'm like, I agree with you that it's boring, but why? And maybe that's my question to ask is like, why is it boring and why does that make it so flexible in these really, and, 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 and active in these kind of environments? I don't know, that doesn't answer your question. Do you have any more insight on? It's just like conspiracy theory everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and maybe if you're like boring and nondescript, like, you know, like the Chouinelle is like, oh, I have this flagella and I'm making this EBS and the Marino Bacter is like rod. You know, so maybe you just have, like, you can just sneak into anything, you know, and like, you know, like, I don't know. But it's everywhere. It's, in, it's not in the soils, but it's in all the brines. And so that's why, it, and even though it's boring, we decided we had to name it because none of the Marino Bacters had a proper species name. So it's Galitis murea, the icy brine. Boring, but. <laughs> oh, great question. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I was just wondering if um, you saw any differences between the data that you collected in situ with the handheld instruments versus once you brought it back to the lab and analyzed it. Okay, so any sample in particular or just uh, anything? From blood pulse. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, okay, I tell my students that when you look at a sample, you change it, right? Like, that's become my philosophy because I honestly believe that. It's like, um, but uh, one thing that gives me some faith, uh, so I think there's, I think what it shows is that you have to measure and see as much as you can. The more you can, the better, right? That's where you're going to get. And unless the, 
act of measuring in situ contaminates your sample more or is more destructive, right? Because you can't take all the tools sometimes with you. Um, but what I found, uh, I guess, inspiring is I showed you that the sample collected with the um, ice, ice mole um, at the 17 meter mark was um, had a high similarity to the community composition, relative abundance and community composition that I collected when I had a really clean, actively flowing sample where at the surface I didn't detect any oxygen and a 1999 freezer dive sample that I got from my PI's lab. So, and that I did by like clone library and I had so few clones, like, you know, embarrassing, I know, versus like the Amplicon, right? So by different measurements, different sample collections and different techniques, we were still seeing the same abundant community members. We had way better resolution, obviously, with Amplicon sequencing. We had a way cleaner sample um, with the, the MEL probe, but, um, you know, in those samples, I wasn't seeing a lot of difference. Now, with the, the things that Eli's flute was measuring at the surface, I think it's hard telling not knowing. I'd much rather get Eli, and she may go kicking and screaming, but taking her into the field with her instruments and get her to, to measure and teach you, and then that, I think, would be a better test. Great question. All right. Let's thank our speaker again. Thank you. Now we'll have a lunch break out in the hallway. Uh, lunch will be served, and that will go until 1 p.m. And then at 1, we'll start session number three. So thank you all for being here. Thank you. Hi. 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 mission operations works in practice and hopefully convince you to become involved in actual space mission operations in the future. Um, I was actually a planetary scientist during undergrad. I was studying the crater. 
When I graduated, I got a job doing Mars rover operations where I fell in love with ops. And then I came here to Georgia Tech to be the operations lead for a NASA mission called Lunar Flashlight that just wrapped up this past December. So I have some ops of experience. And we're going to do an overview right now. I don't have my presenter notes either, so I'm going to kind of wing it. Um, but uh, so this is Lunar Flashlight. It's a 6U NASA CubeSat that uh, flew for about a year. We launched in December 22. Oops. Whoa. Here. Um, we operated Lunar Flashlight for about a year. Um, and Lunar Flashlight was an incredible mission. It was operated completely by students. The first ever student mission, uh, the first ever interplanetary mission to be operated entirely by students. And Lunar Flashlight was a great learning opportunity because we had some significant problems with our thrusters. We had debris accumulating in our field lines that eventually completely clogged our thrusters and kept us from getting to the moon. But we did all sorts of crazy stuff to try to fix the problems. Of all these blocks, only three of them were ever planned to do before launch. Everything else we did in response to the anomalies that we experienced in flight. After we uh, missed our chance to get to the moon, JPL handed the spacecraft over to us. They said, here, Georgia Tech, do whatever you want with this. And we continued to operate it for six months in an extended uh, imaging campaign where we used our star tracker to take uh, images of planets and do optical navigation experiments. And eventually, we got too far away to communicate with Lunar Flashlight reliably, so we had to pull the plug. But it was a fantastic mission, and we all learned a lot. All right. So what are mission operations? Well, let's assume that other people have done all the hard work of making the spacecraft, and now we get to do the fun part and fly it around. So operators have two goals. We keep the spacecraft healthy by making sure that we don't do anything bad to the spacecraft, which is easier to do than you might think. And we also uh, respond to any anomalies that the spacecraft is experiencing. And our second goal is to accomplish mission objectives, most importantly, all the fun science usually the reason why we launched the spacecraft in the first place. Uh, so we go through a number of key processes to do those two goals. There's a lot wrapped up in there. The first kind of big process that we do at a high level is called mission planning. And this is when the entire project gets together. So scientists, engineers, uh, managers, everybody. And we answer the question, what do we want to do? What are we going to have the satellite do? What are we going to have the rover do? Um, everybody collaborates together. They build a timeline of activities. This is an example of a uh, mission events timeline for lunar flashlight, but a timeline for something like a rover is a lot more complicated. And we take all these different considerations into account, physical geometry, where is your satellite viewing opportunities, when, do we, when can we use the deep space network, how much fuel do we have, how much data storage space do we have available, how much time do we have, all these conflicting goals, human things like holidays, that all goes and gets wrapped up together into these uh, mission timelines. Once we know what we want to do with the spacecraft, we actually have to figure out how we're going to do it, which is called activity development. So activities are all sorts of things, maneuvers, science observations. Um, but there's a lot that goes into figuring out what we're going to do to actually implement this activity. Uh, writing command sequences to send to the spacecraft to actually tell it what to do is hugely important. Tons of modeling analysis to make sure that everything is going to go as planned. So, so, so much testing in so many meetings. Um, but scientists and operators will work together during this to make sure that the activity accomplishes the desired science goals, and the operators make sure that nothing is going to go wrong, right? Um, here's an example of the lunar flashlight test bed. We ran everything on the test bed before we ran it on the flight unit to make sure that nothing would go wrong. So when you're actually commanding your spacecraft, uh, most missions will uplink these command sequence files that they write on the ground, test on the ground, and then send to the spacecraft and say, go, do this thing. Uh, so here's an example of one for lunar flashlight. This is actually an experiment where we were firing lunar flashlight's infrared laser at some observatories on the ground as we flew past Earth. Uh, lunar flashlight had a near-infrared uh, laser reflectometer that was designed for looking at uh, surface water ice on permanently shattered re regions on the lunar south pole, but we never made it to the moon, so we might as well use it and shoot some observatories at Earth to see if we can see it. Once you've uplinked something and your spacecraft has done the stuff that you wanted it to do, you then downlink information from the spacecraft. 
most excitedly, you downlink these science data products, like this lunar flashlight star tracker image that we acquired. Uh, but you're also downlinking a lot of EHA, which is just kind of health telemetry that tells you about the state of the spacecraft, voltages, temperatures, subsystem status, that sort of thing. Downlink is heavily constrained by these factors, like when you can actually make contact with your spacecraft. And this results, uh, because of these downlink constraints, sometimes you acquire some exciting science observation on your spacecraft, and then you have to wait weeks to get a downlink to the ground, which can be very frustrating for scientists. Uh, and then after downlink is complete, we take the results and we go back and use them to inform mission planning and future spacecraft activities. Okay, so during this entire process, I just want to talk about kind of the mindset that operators are in. So the two big things are we're thinking at a system level. So considering not only the spacecraft as an entire system, rather than just focusing on like a single uh, payload, but also thinking about the entire mission ops system, like the ground data system and uh, your ground stations and everything, it's all connected. And we need to know how changes, anomalies, something happens here, we need to know how that propagates and affects things uh, on like a different spacecraft subsystem, for example. Sorry, this is giving a lot of feedback. Um, and then also, we have a risk mindset. Uh, there's a lot of difficult decisions that need to be made during operations. And a easy way to make a decision is by picking the option that results in less risk to the mission. Uh, and this is a mindset that can help you if you're designing an instrument or designing a spacecraft, and also if you're operating one. Every decision you make is a risk trade, and to maximize the chances of your mission success, you do want to minimize or mitigate those risks. Okay, so now we're going to talk about a couple different operation paradigms. I'm not sure how much time I have, um, so maybe someone just wave a hand at me if I need to get off the stage. Um, so uh, we're going to talk about some operational uh, paradigms and how that will affect how operations happens in practice. So LEO, uh, low Earth orbit ops, this is the most common orbital regime for remote sensing missions of Earth. You get a lot of coverage. Satellites move very quickly around the Earth, so you can see a ground track. You're getting a lot of coverage, so lots of good imaging opportunities. But because you're moving so quickly, your satellites get uh, very short passes over your ground tracks every day. So there's a lot of very heavy ground automation that happens in these missions. Humans can't really keep up with the like, I need to track the satellite with my antenna, right? So um, it's a very automated process. You want to queue your commands. And uh, for remote sensing missions, the input from scientists are like, where and when are we requiring these images, right? Like satellite uh, trajectories are fairly predictable. So you can look out into the future and say, OK, we want tar we, our targets are this, 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 this. And then uh, the mission will acquire those, downlink them eventually, and then you get your input. When you go into beyond Earth operations, this is when a uh, light time delay from the Earth to your spacecraft starts to have a huge effect on how you operate your spacecraft. So something like lunar flashlight that's in cis lunar space has a light time delay on the order of seconds, maybe three seconds to 30 seconds. Uh, but something like Voyager 1 has a uh, one-way light time of 22 and a half hours. So that has a lot of implications for the autonomy that you need on the spacecraft, how you operate the spacecraft. You can't uplink and downlink at the same time because the signal takes so long to go from point A to point B. When you go to beyond Earth, you have to use NASA's Deep Space Network, which is a uh, network of antennas around the Earth. These are the only antennas that are big enough to talk to stuff that's far away from Earth. They have 35 meter antennas and 70 meter antennas. They're huge. Uh, mission planning cadence, typically on the order of weeks. Um, you'll have, but it depends on mission phase. So this is when the scientists and engineers will get together and figure out what the mission is going to do in the future. And uh, a challenging thing when you have these beyond Earth missions is that you have many critical mission events, right? So let's say you're doing some like Cassini going to Saturn, right? You have one chance to enter your orbit. Right, you're following your trajectory, you have one chance to do a critical propulsive burn, enter the orbit. If something goes wrong uh, and you miss that opportunity, your spacecraft went to safe mode or something, you're done. Your mission's kind of over. right? Um, so that's why uh, risk is hugely important when it comes to these beyond Earth missions. Moving on to surface operations, so this is when we have rovers or landers on another planetary surface. 
Uh, a big difference between like this beyond Earth operations and surface operations is what happens if something goes wrong, right? If you're in a, if you miss your opportunity to enter an orbit, you're kind of toast. But if something goes wrong with the rover, what happens? You just sit there, right? If you have an MMRTG on your uh, or a nuclear power <coughs> on your rover, you don't even have to worry about power or anything. Your rover is not going to fly off into space if something goes wrong. So um, that kind of informs the operational paradigm and like the risk <coughs> posture and how operations are conducted. Specifically talking about Mars rovers, this is a very interesting ops process that JPL has been tuning for decades. Um, Mars rovers drive a lot, so every day is new. It's pretty interesting. Everyone signs on for their shift at the start of the day. You look at the new location that the rover is driven to. During the first couple meetings of the day, scientists, all the science team gets together. They say, oh, that rock is interesting. I want to shoot that with a laser. That, those are interesting. I want to take images of those. They talk and debate and figure out how, what they can fit into the science plan for the day. And uh, eventually, everybody agrees. Operators go on and they implement the plans, send those plans to the rover, which will then execute them. And that all happens in less than eight hours. It's pretty impressive. They have this process down really, really well. And then mission planning uh, at the Mars uh, rover ops level happens like on a day-to-day -day basis. What are we doing today? Also, what are we doing this week? What are we doing this month? Um, happens on a variety of scales. And input from scientists is incredibly important for knowing what we need to do with the rover, to drive it, what to drill, that sort of thing. All right, so conclusion. Uh, mission operations is a collaboration between all sorts of project members. Everybody is critical in order for our operations to be successful. Lunar Flashlight and other university missions, like we have uh, GPDM advisors upcoming at uh, Georgia Tech, allow uh, us students to participate in operations, which gives us super valuable experience with all different elements of what space ops is like in practice, how missions actually work pragmatically. And ops can teach us about all these things in an interconnected uh, system rather than just like looking at some data on your screen, right? It's really great to understand the context of where it came from, how uh, you got it, and you can also, if you join Ops as a science team member, you can be the one to say, we need to go take a picture of that. And uh, nothing's more exciting than being the first one to see a picture of Mars as it's downlink. So I hope you all get to experience that one day. Thank you. The flight software for Flashlight was written in F prime, but the mission was developed by JPL. So JPL wrote all the F prime. They actually never gave us the flight software, which is a huge pain for us. Um, but so we had kind of had to figure out how it worked through trial and error rather than just looking at some source code. Yeah. We're spared the pains of F prime. <laughs> yeah. no, yes, we were. <laughs> all right, we can take one more question. Um, I was just curious, uh, with Lunar Flashlight, what would you say was the biggest operations challenge? The biggest ops challenge on Flashlight? Um, from an operational like process perspective, let, like set aside everything wrong that was happening with the spacecraft. <laughs> <laughs> um, we were the first ever university that had a connection to NASA's Deep Space Network. The only places that have had connections to that in the past are like some businesses, but mostly just NASA centers. And um, that was a huge cybersecurity risk. They don't want bad actors getting through uh, Georgia Tech's network and hacking into the deep space network. It'd be really bad. So there was all these hoops we had to jump through cybersecurity-wise. I didn't see them coming, but they were huge uh, pains to get that all working. Um, that was operationally a huge pain, <laughs> yeah. Right. Cool. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have Tyler Farr, a study on the thermal extraction device from lunar regolith simulant using concentrated solar thermal technology. Put on there. All right. 
Well, hello. Um, as, as you said, my name is Todd Farr, and my work that we've done on the Clever Project, formerly The Reveals, is on studying the thermal extraction of ice from the lunar regular simulant using concentrated solar thermal technology. I can clear forward. So the main purpose of this research is figuring out a way to harness solar power and use it for lunar water extraction. We're hoping to develop ISO technology specifically aimed at the water ice deposits within permanently shadowed regions. The way we hope to accomplish this is by implementing concentrated solar thermal technology to enable us to sublimate the trapped ice. This can be done with our heliostats around the per often permanently illuminated rims of these permanently shadowed regions. Part of this work is going to be used to, uh, or what we're hoping to do is experiment under simulated lunar conditions since NASA doesn't have the budget to send me out to the moon itself. Uh, and we can also accomplish this using our high flux solar simulator, which we can get into later. And this work also employs some computational modeling and X-ray tomography to enhance system optimization and work towards efficient extraction. So some of the challenges that comes with concentrated soil technology on the lunar surface is the fact that the lunar soil is highly reflective to sunlight and is a poor thermal conductor due to the porosity in a vacuum. So the solution we've devised to overcome this is to include an indirect solar receiver. What this is is often a metal uh, solar receiver that we can embed into the lunar regular, or the lunar regular soil and then that would capture and redirect some of the solar energy down into the packed bed. We can also use selective coatings to optimize for absorption and readmission. The other benefit of this is it allows us to penetrate heat further down into the pack bed, not just at the surface level. As I mentioned, we're using a high flux solar simulator to emulate some of this lunar radiation or the concentrated solar radiation. What, what this does is it has an array of xenon arc lamps that can focus. Um, solar radiation to a 40 millimeter focal spot and emulate up to 5,000 kilowatts per meter or 5,000 yeah, kilowatts per meter squared, which is approximately 5,000 times the power of the sun onto the size of a poker chip, uh, which can melt straight through steel, but luckily we're not using all that power in some of these experiments. The radiation is beamed down into our concentrated lunar and rapid kinetics reactor, which I've nicknamed Clark after another solar powered extraterrestrial. Uh, Clark consists of a series of molecular ion vacuum pumps to achieve high to ultra-high vacuum conditions, has a pulse tube cryocooler to achieve those cryogenic conditions we're expecting, as well as a suite of mass spectrometers and uh, ion gauges to measure the uh, evolution and sublimation rates. Inside, right below the quartz viewport, is our packed bed embedded with the indirect solar receiver. This packed bed is made just by manually mixing ice or water with lunar regular simulants. Uh, and then pouring that loosely or packing that into the Scott Crucible and then embedding the indirect solar receiver as well as a series of uh, T-type thermocouples. During this experiment, we're trying to measure various key parameters that we expect, uh, you know, certain range of parameters we'd expect on the lunar surface, uh, as well as kind of extending that range a bit so we can have a much more extrapolative model uh, from these experiments. So some of those Key parameters include water content going from you know, zero or one up to 5%, maybe even 10% water content, as well as changing the irradiation levels that we'd expect from concentrated solar system and changing the porosity of these pack beds. Because um, again, we don't know the exact porosity that we expect up there. And the more data we can simulate here, the better our model will be at predicting. So during these experiments, uh, this is you know just top-down view of Clark itself. So it starts off with the system being pre-cooled and uh, achieving the vacuum conditions. We then have the incident radiation directed through the quartz viewport past this 40 millimeter focal uh, radiation shield just to block any stray rays, and then it strikes the indirect solar receiver. From then, we can monitor the total pressure as uh, with the ion filament gauge and measure the partial pressure of the gas is being sublimated with a mass spectrometer. And at the exit of the system, we have uh, desiccant traps to capture any of the sublimated water coming off. Uh, and then we can compare that with the mass spectrometer as well to get a temporal response of uh, the sublimation rate. And here are some of the preliminary results. Um, I say preliminary because the one thing I was taught as an engineer is it takes pi times longer than you expect to finish an experiment. Um, so these are some of the initial results and the other ones we're working on. 
So what we can see is with a crowd cooler system, we are able to get, you know, to those relative thermal conditions that we expect on the lunar surface, anywhere down to 120 Kelvin. We could get lower different geometries, but this is sufficient to start. Uh, here is a plot of the temperature response during the sublimation or the uh, irradiation periods. As you can see, it goes from you know 160 degrees, 160 Kelvin, and just spikes up to you know above room temperature in a matter of 10, 15 minutes. Again, showing the power that we have with concentrated solar uh, technology. Uh, and you can see the huge thermal gradient that's across this pack bed that's, again, due to the low thermal conductivity of the regular simulants. And here is just some of the mass spectrometer results that we have. Again, these are preliminary, but showing that we do see the pressure spike. We do see an increased rise in the uh, water content um, and not in some of the other gases. But we are able to analyze this. Uh, and funny enough, we had such a huge pressure as we actually you know, spiked past the reading limits of our mass spec, um, which is a good problem because we're getting a lot of sublimation. Bad problem is it's too much pressure. So fun problem to have. Outside of this, we're also doing some of the experimental work, or sorry, computational work, so we can use the experiments to inform the model, use the model to then try to refine and optimize the experiments uh, in a coupled manner. So here are some of the initial uh, 2D axis symmetric models that we have, and we can simulate this under you know, 12 and a half suns for up to 20 minutes. It would run longer, but it's just a lot of computational power. Uh, Outside of this, we're hoping to move to 3D as well. And one of the big changes uh, and things we're trying to implement is X-ray tomography, which is done at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. What they're able to do is take pack bed, the lunar simulant itself, do X-ray tomography scans, which are high resolution scans of the pack bed, kind of like a CT scan. And from this stack, we get a stack of 2D images. From that, we can convert that into 3D objects. Uh, and here, we're hoping to take this and extract some of the what used to be model fit parameters like tortuosity or diffusivity and actually just empirically measure them through the pack beds. Uh, so we're hoping to use that to inform our models and have higher fidelity, higher fidelity models and ANSYS to inform uh, some of the computational and experimental work. So just in summary, we have demonstrated that we can use concentrated solar thermal technology and an indirect solar receiver in the application when it comes to in situ lunar water extraction. We have shown preliminary cases that this is feasible in our experimental setup and we are actually sublimating water and capturing it. And we're hoping to identify some of the critical factors that impact some of the sublimation rates and which is most important or which is key to understand in some of these upcoming uh, NASA missions so we can know what's most vital uh, properties to extract and update our models with. And again, we're hoping to advance IRCU through these innovative experimental and computational models. The overall goal and the tagline I always have is we're trying to use sunlight and lunar rocks to create a gas station on the moon. <laughs> um, and again, trying to create the moon as a pivotal resource hub for future space exploration. Uh, just acknowledging this is again work that was started on reveals and now moved over to Clever. And thank you. cooling down or just when it's so, so you yeah so if, if you if you're you know pulling a vacuum before it's cooled down you're going to sublimate the water right yeah so so how do, how do you manage to control that it's not so much a trying to control that just trying to determine what it is because you're right as we're pulling back it's this balance between do we pre-cool to get it to lower the sublimation rate before pulling a vacuum do we pull back and quickly and try to freeze it flash it's a challenge. We're still working on uh, some solutions to that. But the one thing that I am doing is I'm measuring the sublimation rate off sun, as I call it. Um, so that way, when we so I measure off sun, I have a switch for when it's on sun, so we can have two separate sublimation capturing systems. So that way, when we start the experiment or when we show them some of the plots, we say, okay, we're starting at if we start at 10 grams of water initially. Uh, by the time we start the simulator, we're at eight grams of water, so we know what that percentages and then just trying to uh, 
backtrack and say, okay, if we're losing 2% of the water, let's add an extra 2% at the beginning and track all that. And so we can start the experiment with 5% or whatever it is. But that's the biggest pain. Yeah, yeah, I got you. Thanks. I was wondering if you looked at how radiation interacts with regular, there's some simulators out there that I've seen talks on, uh, where like more than just like the UV rays or they're like actually heating up the subsurface. I saw this in the context of caves getting really, really hot because the, the uh, like the radiation will go through the regular and then the cave gets like super, super hot. Have you, have you looked at anything about that? Uh, we're starting to. Um, I think some of these initial results are just focused. Like we're trying to narrow the scope on just the sublimation rates that we have, but we have other uh, collaborators and teammates in our project that are doing other impacts from the solar radiation or just you know other um, sort of extra, not extraterrestrial but space radiation essentially all that and how that impacts the regolith. So. All right. Thank you again. All right, and next up we have the CMO folks. Cool, okay. Perfect. That's picking it up, more or less. Awesome. So I'm going to be continuing the whole story of water on the moon and water other places, uh, talking about some experiments that I've been doing recently, looking at water ice and how the structure changes when I prepare it in different ways. And this is studies of microscopic ice, but it has implications for other areas of ice in the solar system and beyond, like the enormous looming Enceladus in the background here. So to talk a little bit about ice in space, we've heard about different domains of ice uh, throughout the day today. So we've heard about ice shells and planetary scale, where ice covers everything, um, places like Europa and Enceladus. So this picture here uh, is of Europa with some plumes at the bottom, and we'll come back to that. And we can also think of a smaller scale where more regional ice accumulation. So places like Earth's polar caps or uh, ice is in permanently shadowed regions on the moon, like we just heard with Tyler's talk. And this is a picture of some of those permanently shadowed regions uh, in the lunar south pole. There's also places like comets, which aren't quite big enough to be planets, but definitely have a lot of ice in them. And then we get to the smallest scale, which is what I'm most concerned with, which is the microscopic scale. So this is ice particles, and they can be very small, uh, even just a couple microns across, up to more along the lines of uh, millimeters, sometimes centimeters, but always very small. And these can form in a couple of different ways. One of them is through cryovolcanism. So cryovolcanic particles, like Enceladus here, spewing out all of these ice particles, can actually, this can produce enough ice particles to form Saturn's E-ring here. So there's definitely a lot of ice there. There's also ice uh, other places in the universe, and things like interstellar dust grains, those can get really coated in ice over the long periods of time. So to talk a little bit more about these types of ice and ice microscopic formation, so the first method uh, is hit and stick. And this is a very well studied method because it may be one of the predominant ways of forming ice in the universe. And it's what it is like what the name makes it sound. So you have gas particles that are floating around, and they touch a cold surface, and the surface is cold enough that they stick immediately where they land. They don't really have enough energy to move around on the surface. And this is very common in low-pressure environments. So on the moon, this may be how permanently shadowed regions form or uh, remain present for a while. And this could also be how interstellar particles accumulate their ice. So like in this picture here, this is a close-up of the Carina Nebula, where all the beautiful colors and the, this uh, really rich brown, that's all the different dust particles. And those dust particles may be covered in ice because they're at such a low temperature. This actually may, may be the most common form of ice anywhere in the universe. So this is one way of forming ice. There's also another way of forming microscopic ice, and that's flash freezing of a liquid. So this requires a rapid liquid to solid transition, which means you must have a liquid to begin with. So you need more water in that particular place, but you also need the right temperature and pressure conditions in order to form that liquid water. So 
this liquid water may be very abundant in the universe. It may be less abundant in the universe. That's another big unanswered question with a lot of uh, astrobiological importance. Um, but we know for sure that cryovolcanic plumes can indicate this sort of liquid water. And if you have this plume where there's water uh, underneath the surface erupting and forming these ice jets, that may be where flash freezing can happen on places like Enceladus, shown here, um, also Europa, Triton, possibly others inside and outside our solar system. So this is how this ice can form in space. How do I actually make this in the lab? Well, we have to make the lab look a little bit more like space, which requires a lot of different instruments. This is a picture of my ultra high vacuum chamber. Um, it's in uh, not the best health right now, so best wishes for quick recovery. Um, also, <laughs> the low pressure conditions that I'm looking at are getting at the sorts of pressure conditions we might see in space. So this ultra high vacuum chamber is pressures of about one times 10 to the minus eight torr. For comparison, uh, we're here in Atlanta, a little bit above sea level, that's about 730 torr. So a pretty big difference. I need two really good pumps to pull the pressure that low. We also need a very low temperature to produce this ice. So I cool it with liquid nitrogen by just pouring it down this funnel here. And that can get the sample to temperatures of about 90 Kelvin. Uh, for comparison, that's 183, uh, negative 183 Celsius or negative 298 Fahrenheit. I don't like to touch this with my bare hands. For reason. <laughs> and we can also make sure that there's not a lot of atmospheric contamination um, by having a mass spec on the system as well. And I won't be talking about the mass spec data today, but that is something that we're looking at uh, in the future. So now that we've got space conditions, we actually need to make the ice. And so I'll be talking about these two ice formation methods today, vapor deposition and injection. And for convenience, all the vapor deposition stuff is going to be on the left, all the injection stuff is going to be on the right, and that'll continue through as I start showing some data. But in terms of actually forming this ice, for vapor deposition, I start with a gas doser here, and it has a little dial, I can turn that and leak small amounts of water vapor into this ultra high vacuum chamber, so that's this large box. And then these little tiny water molecules will stick on this cooled copper sample holder. And that's the sort of hit and stick mechanism. I can also form ice through injection. So in that case, instead of slowly leaking it with a gas doser, I have a syringe of about 20 microliters of water, and I can just put that in the ultra high vacuum system and inject that ice or that water to form ice very quickly. And the geometry of the system is set up that uh, the jet of water will hit and stick on the, um, the cooled copper surface, but it's more, less of a hit and stick and more of a splat, just a lot of water arriving at once. So that was how I make the ice, but how do I actually look at the ice and the structure of it? To do that, I'm looking mostly in the infrared at this phase sensitive infrared uh, OH stretch. So the OH stretch refers to just the bond between the oxygen and the hydrogen that's stretching as opposed to other modes like bending or a combination of bending and stretching. And this OH stretch shows up at about 3300 wave numbers. This is the three micron band if you prefer microns. And this stretch has been known to be phase sensitive for a while. This figure is actually from 1981, um, showing that different phases, and these are different types of solid phase of ice, look different uh, in this band. So this feature labeled A is more amorphous. It's broader, it's more symmetrical. And that corresponds to this middle picture here of amorphous ice, where the water molecules are just kind of oriented in any which way. There's no particular long range structure. In contrast, you have this stretch labeled C, which is much pointier, much sharper, and that's for crystalline ice, which in this case is over on the right. Um, this is hexagonal ice, in case you're a nice person and know all sorts of different types of ice. And with hexagonal ice and other forms of crystalline ice, the water molecules follow a very rigid pattern um, with very few defects in it. And the, these differences show up in the spectra. So, that was all the previous data. This is actually my data. So again, vapor depositions on the left and injections on the right, um, same axes. So we're looking at the same 3,300 wave number stretch. And I'll be continuing that for the rest of this talk too. 
So in comparing and contrasting these two, um, I'm looking at four different temperatures that I form these ices at. So in both of these plots, the gray solid line is 91 Kelvin. That's about as cold as I can get. And then I have the warmest I can get, which is 165 Kelvin, and that's the green dot and dashed line. In between, I also have uh, 113 Kelvin, the red dashed line, and 140 Kelvin, the blue dotted line. <clears throat> and the important thing about these two is within each method, the formation temperature really produces a change in the stretch and therefore the configuration. But also, crucially, at none of these temperatures do these two look the same. At 91 Kelvin, they look very different, but even with warmer temperatures, even where we'd expect to see mostly this sort of crystalline ice at 165, that doesn't look the same either. So this is how the ice uh, formation temperature can change. What happens when we form the ice cold and then heat it? How does that temperature evolution differ? So that's what I'm showing in these two plots. Um, same axes, the color here refers to the temperature. So the darker, blacker colors, that's the temperature upon immediate formation. And then I heat the ice at a steady rate of one Kelvin per minute and take an infrared scan every minute or every one Kelvin. And until I get to the brighter temperatures, the more yellow ones of 200 Celsius. So the trend that you can see with both of these is there's this purplish band up here and also over there, where the ice after forming stays pretty much in the same configuration up until about 150. And then at around 150, that shifts to these orange bands over here and over here. So there's a slight shift in the peak position, which means there's also some sort of structural change underlying that. And those bands stay consistent for a little bit, but with even more heating, eventually you lose this longer wave number feature, and you're left with just this shorter wave number feature. And that's an indication of the ice becoming completely crystalline. If you heat the ice even more, eventually it's warm enough that you don't have any ice anymore. You lose the ice, and so you lose the feature. <laughs> so I'm not, <laughs> I'm not as focused on this stuff because then ice is gone. So another way of looking at the same data is by looking at a heat map. So these are slightly different axes. Here, the x-axis is temperature, the y-axis is wave number, and the color corresponds to the strength of the absorbance. So the features that we were just looking at shows up as this bright band at 3,300 um, in both the vapor deposition and the injection data. And there's a very slight change in the position. It's kind of hard to see. It's a little bit easier to see over here. But that band at 150 uh, Kelvin, the 3300 wave number band, slightly shifts in position. And that's, uh, this is another way of representing that shift from the more purpley cold bands to the redder, warmer bands. And again, if you heat it up enough, the ice is completely gone. Uh, the other features here are also water features, and it's harder to tell because they're not quite as strong, but they do also shift at 150 color. So that was all how these two methods differ from each other, but how does that actually relate to what the ice looks like, the phase, the structure behind it? So to do that, we've been looking at this paper by Kringle et al., and they were looking at uh, if you have ice of different formations and you heat it with pulses of laser, how does that change? So they were looking at three different phases, so similarly to the phases that I was looking at. They have this black line here, CI, or crystalline ice, and then LDA is this blue line with a more symmetrical peak, and that's low-density amorphous ice. But they were also looking at this third feature, or this third phase of ice, this HQW, or highly quenched water feature. And compared to the other two, it doesn't really have as much of this shorter wave number feature. It's more heavily weighted to the longer wave number feature. And hyperquenched water you form by having liquid water that you cool very, very rapidly, so rapidly that it can't even form the amorphous configuration. It might be more directly thermodynamically connected to liquid water just at cold temperatures. And this requires a cooling rate of more than 10 to the fifth Kelvin per second. So pretty intense. And it happens to look very similar to my injection data at 113 Kelvin, with this more prominent feature at longer wave numbers and a less prominent feature at shorter wave numbers. So some ongoing work that I've been doing is using 
my experimental data versions of these three phases and fitting that to each one of these lines, to every temperature point, and looking at the phases and how those phases evolve. I don't have time to go through all of that today, but if you're interested, yeah, please talk to me about that. Um, it's definitely something that we're continuing to work on. So in conclusion, uh, these different formation methods produce different ice structures at different at every temperature that we've studied. And we can look at those structures by looking at this particular OH stretch. And the fact that different formation methods produce different ice structures means that also cryovolcanism and hit and stick ices also probably have different structures. So if we can look at the structures, we might be able to tell more of how they formed. And also, because I'm an experimental scientist, I have to talk about the experiments, there's a real importance for laboratory experiments to be standardized. If you're comparing a more injection experiment to the more widely documented literature hit and stick experiments, it's important to know that just the method may also produce changes, regardless of what else you're studying. So I would like to thank uh, Reveals and Clever for funding all of this work, and Richard Bedell from the Chemistry Instrumentation Support. Uh, without him, none of my stuff would ever work. And thank you all. temperatures of about um, 177. Um, I think that's warm enough that it's less, it's probably a combination of yes, there's some amorphous ice being lost first, but it's also some of the amorphous ice converting to crystalline ice. So I think it's kind of hard to disentangle those two processes um, because there's not a ton of water desorbing uh, at this time. It doesn't really show up in the mass spec all that well. But yeah, I think it's a combination of some being lost and some being um, being converted. And I think that's why that feature increases is from the ice that's being converted. Yeah, great question, thanks. Yeah, so that's a really great question. Um, if I go back to the, yeah, this slide, so any impurities could really disrupt uh, amorphous stuff. It could provide some sort of template for things to crystallize on. It could also disrupt some of the lattice matching and crystalline ice. And actually, that's uh, what was what really got us into this project. We were originally hoping to look at how the presence of minerals can change the structure of ice. And then it turns out that even just injecting the pure water was producing these differences. So <laughs> the answer is yes, it definitely does change in probably very complicated ways. Um, it definitely has to do with the chemistry and the charging of the different uh, impurities, but probably also with like the lattice structure. Um, I know with nanoparticle synthesis, for example, they're really concerned about lattice mismatch and how that how the underlying structure can change the, the structures that build on top of it. And that very well might be happening with, with our eyes too. So stay tuned. <laughs> The title earlier, How to Hack Can You Fly This Thing? I, I wanted to compete for coolest title, so I went with more words. <laughs> uh, I'm going to tell you all how I shoot lasers at dirt to try to find aliens. I think it's pretty <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, so first I want to start by saying thank you to everybody so I don't run out of time. Um, a huge thank you to my really good buddy Chad, who is also one of the organizers of this event. Um, these are his samples that I'm going to talk about later on. Uh, he got funding from OS, so thank you to Ocean Across Space and Time for uh, <laughs> indirectly giving me samples. And um, the DOE is who funded the instrument that I'm going to talk about. So as a brief outline, I'm going to give you motivations for the research that we're working towards, and then I'll talk about Raman technology on the Perseverance rover, so I can compare my instrument uh, to the current technology that's out there, and then I'm going to explain my instrument and um, how we're using it and what future work we might get to do with it. So um, broadly speaking, it's important to characterize uh, mineral composition and detect biosignatures if we're searching for life on other planets, and doing that in planetary analogs enables us to uh, do that here on Earth. Uh, some ancient biosignatures might be better preserved in certain minerals, uh, things like gypsum and hematite uh, precipitation minerals. Uh, there's also uh, planetary analogs where signs of life might be better protected, things like caves where they're protected from surface radiation, maybe. Um, th th there's mineral form formation that might coat biosignatures or also could be a biosignature in themselves. Uh, permafrost, where things are frozen in situ, again, potentially protected from surface processes, and hydrosaline environments, which is um, what Chad samples are, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about more later, but they, they've been hypothesized to be a good place to preserve biosignatures, and um, hypersaline environments could be indicative of a history of water, which again is important to life. So um, all this being said, it's really important to have tools that we can use to capture these, uh, these biosignatures, and we also want to be able to look at the minerals that are there. Doing this quickly with high spatial resolution and without fluorescence interference, or and, and, and at really high um, uh, spe spectral and spatial resolution is very important. So, how is this being done right now? Well, the, the Perseverance rover is on Mars. It has a really awesome spontaneous Raman tool called Sherlock, um, and Sherlock is accompanied by Watson, which is a camera that takes uh, context photos, and then there's also another context imager. Um, I'm gonna now show some data from one of the earlier Perseverance papers uh, from the Dorbus region, just as an example of how Sherlock works. So Watson takes a big picture with uh, 16 to 115 microns per pixel, depending on how, 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 at what scale they want to image. And then ACI zooms in on that and takes an even higher resolution grayscale image that they can overlay with Watson images and these really beautiful soil pictures. And then Sherlock shoots a Raman beam with a 100 micron diameter. So hold that in your mind, 100 micron beam diameter at different grid points across the image. And from that, they can then identify the mineral composition of that 100 micron point, or the predominant mineral composition. So that's what these little labels are. Um, you know, you can see olivine and silicate and stuff very present in this one particular uh, example. So that's what's up there right now. It's awesome. But the technology has advanced. And I'm going to tell you how it's advanced in my lab. And maybe someday, B-cars will get to go up there. So it stands for Broadband Coherent Anti-Stokes Raman Scattering. But I'm going to refer to it as B-cars because that's a mouthful. Uh, there's some huge advantages. There's no fluorescence interference. That's a, that's a big problem with Raman technology right now for mineral studies. Uh, Perseverance has a cool workaround that I'm not going to go into, but other spontaneous Raman is, is really inhibited by fluorescence. It has high spectral resolution, high spatial resolution, and it's much faster than that spontaneous Raman. So I'm going to bring you all back to your high school physics light lessons. Uh, when uh, light hits a sample, there's a bunch of ways it can interact. But the three that I'm going to tell you about are uh, fluorescence and uh, Stokes and anti-Stokes Raman scattering. So uh, if you look at a uh, spectrum of this light, the green peak in the middle is the uh, absorption or the excitation energy. And then you have the light shifted uh, red or blue from that excitation energy. Uh, as you can see, fluorescence is redshifted, which is the same direction as Stokes Raman scattering. This is the uh, what, what's happening with Sherlock. So they're taking advantage of this fluorescence interaction in this fluorescence overlay. But for a lot of cases, fluorescence ends up overpowering your Raman signal, and you you can't figure out what uh, really low concentration or biological samples are in. Um, or signals are in your sample. Conveniently, we're looking at the anti-Stokes scattering, which is the other direction. So there's absolutely no fluorescence interference, and that makes this a really good tool for studying biological and mineralogical samples at the same time. 
the other thing that I want to share with you is how coherent Raman is faster and also stronger uh, in signal acquisition than in spontaneous Raman. So this is how spontaneous Raman works. You have, uh, this is an example with water molecules, but you have chemicals with bonds and they vibrate. And in spontaneous Raman, we're measuring the vibrations by shooting a laser and then measuring the difference in the laser when it comes back. The vibrations are unique and inherent to every chemical, um, depending on the bonds. So if you're doing this at ambient temperatures, everything is vibrating however it is, totally randomly out of sync. And it's a little bit like trying to figure out how many people are in a stadium by listening to like the applause. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's tricky, right? So we're, uh, we're calling up Iceland at the, at the World Cup where everybody was clapping in sync all together all at the same time. And it was really, really loud. And from that, you might have been able to calculate how many people want to see it. Anyways, um, <laughs> we're, we're exciting the molecules to vibrate together at the same time. This is the coherent side of things. So we use a, a, an excitation laser that we call the pump. And it makes all the molecules vibrate at the same time. And then when we use our probe, it's um, it, it's, it's much much easier to detect the bond vibrations. Um, the other huge advantage of this tool is that we're using a broadband excitation laser. Um, this is not something that people do in spontaneous very often, but um, you can do it with spontaneous. We're doing it with this coherent Raman, so we have the advantage of exciting a bunch of things, pretty much anything in a sample that can vibrate, we are exciting and we're getting them all to vibrate together. So we're seeing everything in a sample, and we're seeing it very loudly. So um, this is, Raman is a tool that has been used in a bunch of ways. Um, and so I'm not, I'm not going to argue why Raman is valuable outside of what I've already told you. But um, one big advantage is that it's completely non-invasive um, when, when it's you know, properly designed. <laughs> Our instrument is very preliminary, so we're using a transmission microscope. The laser has to go through the sample, so the sample needs to be thin enough for our laser to go through. But the DOE funding that they gave us was to develop this instrument that uh, will eventually be able to image through about a millimeter of soil to image plant roots in situ and to look at their interactions with microbes in the soil. That's what we proposed. We'll see if we get there. Uh, <laughs> we'll see. But um, let, me, let me show you what we've used it for so far. So uh, this is a plant root organ called a nodule. This is a slice. It's like 20 microns thick. This is just a stereo microscope image of it that, you know, just light. And this is a beakers image overlaid on it. And what's really awesome is that beakers can see sorry, uh, tissue distinctions, and you can see cellular resolution. And the different colors are a statistical thing, sort of like a PCA where uh, each pixel is, is colored depending on how it lines up with the different um, uh, components of, of a variation. And so what you can see is, is not only are you distinguishing tissue types, but you're also finding uh, chemical distinctions in each pixel of the, of the BCARS image. These are hyperspectral images. So at every pixel, we're getting a full Raman spectra. This is like 3,000 wave numbers. It's, it's very dense data. And just as a little comparison, while the instrument was down last year, I tried to um, do the same analysis on the spontaneous Raman in the core. It's an awesome instrument, very useful, but it was completely useless for what I was trying to study. And um, from just comparing these two, you can see that there's a, a much higher density of uh, um, spectral information in the BCAR spectra. And for some published work, in case my preliminary data doesn't convince you, this has also been used to study lipids in um, C. elegans worms. And they've been able to find, uh, they've been able to distinguish between uh, lipid types and also lipid concentration in different parts of the worm. So uh, let's talk about planetary analogs. Chad went to Australia. I'm very jealous. It's awesome. Uh, <laughs> they collected some really cool soil samples. This is from a, the, the a sandy clay. Uh, from the shore of an evaporating lake in Western Australia. You can see that this soil is very red, um, iron, highly scattering sample. We then put these samples on some slides. This is an optical image of the slide. This is an unprocessed BCARS image. And this is what it looks like when we um, color uh, the pixels dependent on the intensity of peaks in the spectra at that pixel. So I set the intensity threshold and uh, based on peaks that corresponded to no minerals, so quartz, and in this case, I think, iron. Um, you can see these weird lines. I'm not trying to falsify data. They were burned pixels, and the only way I could crop them out was by cropping out the whole row, so that's why it looks kind of clunky there. I plan on 
doing more of these experiments, and I'll have better data before we publish anything. <laughs> so now looking at the Raman spectra, um, this is the rough database in black, uh, which is the sort of standard database for finding Raman um, mineral characterization. This is rough peak for quartz. And as you can see, uh, in a pretty solid way, we're lining up with the red region of interest with quartz. And then in teal, we have some little blips that also line up with quartz peaks. And from our conclusions, we decided that this is probably quartz and quartz out of focus. And the out of focus is probably due to the high scattering nature of the iron rich sample. So these are solid preliminary results that tell us, yes, in fact, we can uh, see things that are highly scattering, but maybe not the best. So there might be some optimization there. One thing that I want to point out is the scale bar down here. Uh, we're looking at 12 and a half microns this, for the scale bar. Every pixel in this image is a half micron. I want, to, I want to remind you what Sherlock's resolution is. It's 100 micron beam diameter versus half micron pixel scale. So we're, we're doing pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is the, these are the results that I'm most excited about. Uh, once again, Chad went to Australia. I'm not jealous. I'm very jealous. Uh, <laughs> this is the, uh, the looking through the water at the gypsum crusts. Um, and then they harvested some of those crusts and we mounted them on a slide. This is an optical image. You can sort of see some of the crystal little structures going on. Um, and then we take a BCARS image and, oh my god, now you can start to really clear, clearly see that there's minerals going on in the sample. And then if we do the same thing where we highlight at, uh, we, we give it highlight pixels with an intensity above a certain threshold at a certain peak, um, then we start to distinguish between crystals uh, and, and minerals. So looking at the Raman structure for this, in black is the Raman structure for uh, gypsum. In blue and green are these two different regions of interest. And you can see that they both line up really well with gypsum. But after doing some literature diving, there's, uh, well, you might, you might notice that these, these couple of peaks don't all line up very good. And some of that comes from excitation laser, but in our case, we're using broadband. So based on literature, um, these peaks change depending on the hydration state of your gypsum. So if you uh, take a rock of gypsum and you heat it up so that the water starts leaving uh, the crystal structure, then it turns into anhydrite, and you measure the Raman spectra of that simple as it, as it heats, then you'll notice that these peaks are the ones that change. So from those studies and this data, we're pretty sure that we're looking at gypsum and anhydrite. And again, um, notice the scale bar down here, five microns. These are half, half, half micron resolution. Pretty awesome. So, um, not to go over time too much, I just want to talk about the future work that we're planning on doing. We're going to do some more uh, hypersaline environment studies. Hopefully, we'll be able to inoculate these samples with bacteria so we can try to look at biosignatures and, and cellular resolution mixed in with the microbes. There's some data processing that's kind of tricky in there, but we're going to work on that. Um, I also have permission from some landowners to collect some cave samples from some karst caves, which are not what's on planets, but hopefully, we'll be able to study. Those, those caves and then compare them to lava tubes when we get funding for that, which are um, have been confirmed or strongly hypothesized to be found on the moon and Mars. And we also have some permafrost samples from Charity Phillips Lander in our freezer somewhere that hopefully we'll be able to analyze this uh, semester. And before B cars could go to space, there is some instrument development stuff that needs to go into it. There's, there's technical things like uh, the power that the instrument takes is proportional to the sample acquisition rate, but you know maybe rowers will get better power sources. Um, it's also you know the size of a table, and sometimes like a wire falls out and it stops working. So <laughs> it's a low technology readiness level right now, but I'm optimistic that it'll be um, someday rover rover proof. And of course, we are very open to collaborations, Jill. Um, so, <laughs> so if anyone has, uh, yeah, yeah, if anyone has any samples that they think would be really cool to look at the chemistry in the space that it is existing, um, you know, uh, talk to talk to me afterwards. So that's my talk. Thank you. Very, very cool work, Daddy. This is really cool stuff. Um, so, kind of a technical question, but I was wondering why in, in your spectra the, um, 
big piece that you look like have this very distinctive shape that is different than the uh, than the reference spectra. Yeah, there's yeah. big dip, and then it's sort of higher on the on the other end. Yeah, so I was kind of hoping no one would ask about that. <laughs> is, for a lot of reasons, this data hasn't been published yet, but one of them is that uh, when we use this instrument, the, the, the reason that this instrument, this field hasn't been pursued more heavily is because there's what's called a non-resonant background, which is a huge pain to deal with. And so a lot of people have just given up on it, um, coherent Roman as, as, a, as a pursuit. But <coughs> my advisor, is a very persistent person and thinks that we can, in fact, handle it. And so part of the reason we have this, this weird shape is because the data processing that we have developed, or had developed at the time that I collected this data, was um, managing the non-resonant background in a way that was optimized for biological signal, which is much, much, much lower intensity than mineral signal. When I collect mineral peaks, or, or at, sorry, when I'm collecting mineral data, the signal is loud enough that the NRB isn't really a problem. But in the effort of trying to see biological signal at the same time, um, I was processing them as if they were biological signals. And so then when you're doing some of the parts of uh, the noise reduction and the background process, you end up basically distorting the data in a weird way when there's giant, giant peaks like this. I've since learned that that is a problem. And it is actually an active, ongoing prop, prop, um, work in progress that I'm, I'm Hoping to solve in the near future. Thanks for asking. Though. Great, thanks, Adam. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great question. So um, the way that this instrument was proposed, and we have still not achieved this yet, so I'm not, I'm not going to promise anything. But uh, based on the theory and the way that this instrument was proposed, the focal point of the laser uh, can be focused underneath a, a sample surface. So if the sample is not scattering too much, then the laser should be able to go through it. So for example, we image through glass slides really easily. We image through water really easily. But as soon as you start introducing things like iron, for example, I had problems with, or um, like soil surfaces are really scattering and, and dark in color, then you start introducing problems where like, you have to blast enough laser at the sample that you start to burn the sample surface, which th there's pros and cons to that. But right, right now, we haven't sort of circumnavigated the burning the crap out of our sample yet. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure if it'll get there anytime soon, but that's in theory, we should be able to do it. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Abby. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to take a short 10 minute break here and come back at 2.15 for our final keynote speaker of the day from Dr. Toshi Hirabayashi. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, we'll get back to you. Uh,
it's got to be Brown. that neurons are so sensitive to bad protein folding in cryostasis. And, uh, and like, long frames. And for me, you know, like, we say, says they go to our The, the, the instant you learn that the largest known dinosaur in the world is a We only have birds. Bears. They're, they're like a generic mammal, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. I I joined here last fall. 
So a pretty much new, and I'm really glad to be here. Uh, so any inputs uh, would be really appreciated. So today's talk will be uh, discussing uh, NASA Dark Mission. Well, the bio said I am a co I of Dark, but I was. The reason is uh, mission was completed. So uh, <laughs> it was a really great thing. So um, I'm gonna give you a lot of pictures rather than giving you know uh, a lot of like uh, scientific plots. So you'd be able to enjoy uh, rather than looking at a, a true science. Um, also, I want to give you know some like uh, 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 stories uh, behind the mission. So that that's gonna be uh, sort of like what I want to discuss today. All right, so uh, NASA DART, this is an uh, inter uh, international mission. Um, basically, like, there are so many different uh, teams, uh, institutions uh, involved in uh, DART mission. Uh, the reason is that DART is uh, uh, categorized as a planetary defense mission. And uh, this is an international effort that uh, recently, you know, Decato survey defied. So uh, DART mission is basically uh, leading that effort. Um, I want to mention a little bit about um, why I'm discussing DART uh, in this uh, uh, colloquium, because uh, mainly this is discussing astrobiology, right? Um, let's think about uh, sort of like um, the history of the Earth evolution. For example, dinosaurs. Why they are not here now? <laughs> right? This is because of impacts. And then uh, when it comes to you know, uh, us, we are actually uh, uh, living here. Well, uh, impacts are one of the most common features in a solar system. You know, every single planet are experiencing you know, uh, impacts. However, uh, right now, if we have a similar situation on the Earth, do we appreciate that? The answer is no, because it's going to be killing us. So uh, <laughs> the idea would be uh, we would like to defend Earth from those threats. This is what we are doing in planetary defense. And then the idea would be uh, there are multiple efforts at NASA. And because it said defense, this could be part of DOD. But uh, we are addressing science, so uh, we are doing more like international effort. Regarding uh, DART, uh, this is, um, again, international collaboration, uh, part of AIDA mission. Uh, this is a combination of um, DART as well as HERA. Um, this is an ESA-driven mission. Uh, the idea would be um, this, oops. What I'm doing? <laughs> oh yeah, here you go. So um, in terms of the DART, uh, we are testing uh, kinetic deflection. And then HERA is going to identify how efficient the DART impact was. I'm going to discuss in detail about what DART did and what uh, HERA is going to do on the next slide. So NASA DART has been already done. And um, the idea would be the spacecraft will, uh, would collide with the target asteroid Dimorphos, which is given here. And then uh, we measure uh, the efficiency of kinetic deflection. By kinetic deflection, I mean um, we're going to send ballistic uh, spacecraft to uh, hit the target asteroid to change um, the target orbit. And then we're going to uh, in, in, um, intentionally change the orbital motion of the target body potentially hitting the Earth. All right, so... Uh, we have done this in 2022, and then uh, HERA, this is a European uh, uh, mission, which will send a spacecraft this year, um, one main spacecraft and two CubeSats to look at um, how DART impact was. So 
The target asteroid we call Didymos. This is a binary system, and um, we're gonna um, look at. So we observed how the uh, orbital uh, motion changed, and Hera is gonna look at the details of the impact motion or uh, impact phenomena. All right, so this is the exactly what we're going to do or what we did on, the, uh, on DART. In terms of uh, DART, so the spacecraft was launched on November 24th, 2021, which was almost like uh, two years and a half-ish. And then um, after one year, the spacecraft successfully hit the target asteroid Dimophos. Okay, the target asteroid is um, the satellite of a uh, big asteroid Didymos. This is a really confusing part. Um, the primary is also called Didymos, and binary system is itself is also called Didymos. Um, this is sort of like a really confusing part, and um, um, this is definitely like, oh my gosh, um, IAU <laughs> is actually defining those, right? So, um, um, but anyway, so uh, Dimorphos was our target. And then once we had a collision, we would be able to see the change of this uh, orbit with respect to primary. And then if we observe this through ground-based telescope or space-based telescope, we would be able to characterize how orbit would change, right? So this is the concept of DART. I'm going to use this particular uh, plot. Um, I uh, mentioned this uh, on the previous slide, but basically, like, when you have a, um, a impact point right here, this is the Dimorphos. When you have original orbit of Dimorphos, after the uh, impact, you're gonna have input of linear momentum, right? And then the motion of Dimorphos changes. And then if you could see uh, the behavior of light curve, we can basically observe the orbital change before and after dark, dark impact. All right, so um, DART had a specific goal that was to determine one single parameter. Okay, so if you really want to develop a future mission, just find a very easy explanation that you can convince the government or NASA. <laughs> so this DART mission had one single parameter to determine. We called um, this uh, momentum transfer enhancement coefficient called beta. So the goal of DART was to measure this one. That's it. So what beta is, this is uh, sort of like you need uh, the knowledge of dynamics, which I assume everybody has. <laughs> All right, so think this way. Well, this is a linear momentum conservation. One particle is coming from the right side, from my side. And eventually, the particle hit the target which is sitting somewhere. If beta equals one, those two particles are moving together, all right? What if you have beta equals two? What happened would be, okay, so this is the beta equals one. Beta equals two means there is additional uh, input to momentum transfer, which is ejecta. If you know uh, impact, you have hit on the target, and then some materials goes away, that adds additional momentum. So if you have a beta, you're going to have a small ejecta coming through. On the other hand, if you have a four, then ejecta, more ejecta 
come from the impact side, adding additional momentum. So what we observed there was that depending on how much, um, uh, how much ejecta coming through, you would be able to identify how the kinetic impact was efficient. Okay. In terms of the, um, the spacecraft, this is relatively large compared to other spacecraft. Um, but the main part is just a few meter wide. Um, this is uh, the entire uh, the length of a spacecraft when the solar panels were deployed. So um, in terms of this solar panel, we call ROSA. This is a rollout uh, solar panel, solar array. Uh, this is a part of the unique uh, technology that uh, NASA developed. The idea was that usually solar panels are stored by folding, but this one was stored by rolling in. So when it deployed, basically it opened it and then created a relatively wide solar panel. So the size of this uh, solar panel was about, uh, it says uh, 20, uh, 28 feet long, it's about 10 meter wide. Um, it had uh, two rosas, so the spacecraft itself was like 20 meters wide. There are multiple technologies on board. First one was uh, definitely Draco. This is an uh, imager. This is the eye of the spacecraft. And then uh, the other one is a smart nav. When it comes to um, the key part of the dark mission is to, of course, hit the target, right? In order to do so, they needed a very precise navigation and a control. So what happened was uh, Draco, this is a narrow angle camera. This is the heritage of Lori uh, developed at APL. They used images taken by Draco, feedback to SmartNav so that SmartNav used the images to identify where it was and where it goes. Okay. Um, the frequency of uh, imaging was about uh, one hertz. So every single, um, well, every one second, uh, SmartNav was getting the image from Draco. That's it. So this spacecraft was very simple. The instrument was just this one. It didn't have any like spectroscopic uh, uh, imagers or uh, spectrometers or other instruments. Technically, if you consider, if you want to look at colors, this is definitely a boring mission, right? Um, this is unfortunate, but the idea was um, the cost of the mission was very cheap compared to other one, so you can understand, right? And um, spacecraft itself is going to be gone, right? Because it's going to be hitting. So um, there is another one. Uh, this is the next C. This is the iron thruster. Uh, this is a sort of like new generation iron thruster. And then um, uh, this is a part of like demonstration. If you are part of NASA mission, you recognize that depending on the missions, there are several new technologies that is not for the main part of the mission, but for the demonstration. So uh, next C was something, the device to be demonstrated instead of like having uh, the main goal. Um, the result was sort of like um, uh, disappointing. The reason was um, it didn't work well. Um, so when it comes to um, uh, next C, uh, we did a test. However, we had some anomalies in the power, uh, um, power consumption. So me, uh, next C and our uh, other bus system, those are separated power systems, okay? So when it comes to um, the the power 
uh, charges, those are done by uh, those panels. And then those powers are going to uh, different systems. One is NXT, and the other is the main bus system. When the DART turned on uh, next C, what happened was that we had some like power anomaly on the bus system. This was sort of like dangerous situation, right? Because next C was not our main uh, objective, but when we turn on, it was affecting our main system. So that happened during the cruise uh, phase, and we decided to turn on. So we turn on really shortly after that. Unfortunately, uh, it didn't turn on uh, all the time. Anyway, so those are main uh, key innovations on this spacecraft. Um, the last one is a key spacecraft. Uh, this is a piggyback uh, CubeSat, um, which is developed by um, Italian Space Agency. And it, made, it played a, a big role in this mission. So I'm going to discuss that on the next slide. So this is what we call the Shear Cube. Uh, this was a CubeSat a six unit and uh, provided by an Italian space agency. And then um, the key uh, instruments, uh, there are two cameras. One is Leia and the other is Luke. <laughs> Leia is, yes, Leia is a monochromatic uh, imager. So we try to have like high resolution uh, images. The other is um, uh, RGB imager. Um, so when it comes to those two instruments, unfortunately, Leia didn't work well. Uh, we observed uh, the Earth by using Leia uh, right after the release of this uh, spacecraft from DART. But uh, when it comes to the closest flyby at Didymos, it didn't work. So um, our major analysis was done by Luke Images. Um, I'm going to uh, show you uh, the image from Leia uh, later. And then um, the role of this spacecraft was that we wanted to look at um, the dark impact nicely. So we had a clear timing. So um, it was released uh, about 10 days before the impact so that it can fly by uh, Dimorphos, our target, three minutes after the dark impact. So we had a very precise um, uh, calculation analysis to be able to make sure we can get uh, proper images. And it did it. Um, I want to discuss a little bit about DART level one requirements. Um, in terms of the uh, um, first one, so this is uh, impact demobus. This is the first target we really needed to do. This is a part of like engineering. Um, um, it was an engineering requirement. Next one is to calculate the change of, sorry, uh, make the orbital motion change. So this is the second one. And then third one is to measure the uh, spin period of change. The idea would be we're going to use a spin, uh, space based and uh, ground based telescopes to determine the change of the orbit. Last one is to determine beta. Okay. All right, so um, this is um, uh, the plot showing the uh, where or which observatories uh, join this campaign. So once again, uh, the impact was uh, uh, done on uh, September 26th, 2022. And um, there are a lot of uh, uh, campaigns go on in the nation. So uh, starting from US, uh, uh, European uh, uh, collaborators, as well as in the region of Africa, Australia, and Chile. Uh, Chile is basically, you know, observatories owned by European uh, uh, agencies, right? 
So we have uh, so many uh, 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 campaigns going on on that day and uh, after the impact, like a few months. Also, uh, we had uh, space-based telescopes, HSD, JWST, and Lucy. Lucy is currently going to Torosian asteroids, right? All right, so from now, I'm going to discuss what happens starting from launch. Um, so November 24th, 2021, um, the spacecraft was launched by um, Falcon 9, SpaceX uh, Falcon 9 rocket uh, from Vandenberg Space, Space Force. Um, in terms of this launch, I must say, for me, it is a little bit special. Um, of course, I went there. And uh, the idea was that um, um, we had a uh, really long co uh, COVID quarantine, right? And then um, our mission activities are completely uh, remote. Of course, you know, engineers uh, developed spacecraft in person, but mainly scientific analysis as well as software development, those are done by remotely. So it continues, you know, multiple years. So um, this is sort of like the first time to see the members um, on DART at the launch site. So we had a great opportunity to uh, meet uh, members. Personally, though, um, at the same time, I was feeling I need to have a vacation. <laughs> okay, so basically, science scientists, um, we do not have anything to do during launch, just watching the launch, right? So um, Vandenberg was basically like an hour and a half away from Santa Barbara. So I was thinking like, okay, that's a great time to stay in Santa Barbara and just go to, you know, launch pad to see the launch, coming back to the Santa Barbara again, and I'm swimming. So I <laughs> go there and I'm like, sort of like feeling vacation, staying like really nice, quiet hotel. However, the meetings were completely devastated by, uh, sorry, the plan was completely devastated by team meetings. Uh, so that was something like I was thinking, oh my gosh, yeah, uh, I shouldn't say anything about it. Uh, to go. But anyway, so there are so many different mixing feelings, but the main part was to you know, think, okay, uh, meeting uh, with uh, you know, team members would be great. So uh, I enjoyed it, but the uh, vacation was completely destroyed. <laughs> Anyway, so um, after the launch, uh, we had a lot of exciting um, exercises as well as analysis. One of them uh, is given here. After the launch, it is about uh, almost like 10 months after that. Um, so uh, Draco started capturing uh, planetary bodies. One of them is uh, very cool. So this is Jovian uh, system. The center is uh, Jupiter, and others are the satellites, right? So why we were interested in this, not only for science, but also space uh, smart nav uh, testing example. So you can imagine, smart nav need to guide the spacecraft uh, to correctly uh, hit the morphos, right? So the idea would be uh, Dimorphos is orbiting Didymos, and um, the idea would be Dimorphos is much, much smaller than Didymos, meaning that SmartNav needs to uh, navigate itself towards Didymos first. Later, when the spacecraft can detect Dimorphos, then change the target to Dimorphos. This process is very complicated. However, Jupiter gave a similar situation. So the idea would be, Jupiter, you can imagine this is a Dimorphos, uh, Didymos. Europa, oops. Europa is uh, similar to what Dimorphos does because Didymos is a main, um, you know, big object. And then Europa, like uh, Dimorphos, it is a smaller, much smaller, but 
a spacecraft need to detect later, we would be able to create a similar situation by looking at Europa again, uh, Europa as well, right? Like Europa is rotating, orbiting this way, and then when Europa comes back from Jupiter, that situation is very similar to what we're gonna have on drawing the impact, right? So we did, we used this situation to test this map map, and our process was successful. And then um, this is uh, just two months before uh, the impact uh, spacecraft successfully uh, detected Didymus. Uh, it was uh, just a dot, but we are really thrilled uh, to see that picture. This is from uh, Draco. All right, so we are almost approaching the impact. So this was within uh, 10 days before the impact. Um, when it comes to, uh, this one is Luke, uh, RGB imager, and then this one is from Leia. At that time, we observed, um, we considered uh, Leia is working really well, but uh, it turned out when we look at uh, Leia for Didymos and Dimorphos, the focus was completely uh, off and uh, we couldn't see anything. Uh, image engineer trying to resolve that, but we couldn't get any. But at least we could see uh, Earth really nicely. All right, so this is the impact. This is an image. So uh, it is about like minutes before uh, the impact. If you look at uh, bottom left, this is a big asteroid, uh, Dimorphos, uh, Didymos, and then this small one is our target, uh, Dimorphos. And we are approaching uh, Dimorphos and then eventually hitting the target. <laughs> yep, so this is definitely <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> and, um, this red region is basically saying LOS, right? Um, and uh, we definitely cheered. I was at APL and uh, I was in uh, Science Operations Center, and uh, we are definitely looking at you know very critical moment. And at the same time, um, okay, so we cheered uh, this success not only by hitting uh, the target asteroid Dimorphos, but also the mission ended. So if you're, if you're part of the mission, you definitely recognize that the mission doesn't end. You have an extended mission, people trying to extend the mission, so that uh, you know we're gonna keep using the spacecraft. Uh, that's happened all the time. Um, I definitely uh, discussed with um, uh, program scientists uh, of DART at NASA, basically they uh, were so excited because this mission was ended. No, because, you know, like, um, uh, collision was successful. Because they don't have to spend money more. <laughs> um, I'm a geologist. Uh, at the same time, I'm an engineer. I'm looking at, um, I really like to see um, uh, geological features of asteroids. And then um, when you look at those uh, uh, asteroids, um, they're really cool. And we had a lot of questions, what's going on there? For example, this one, this is about like uh, 160 meter diameter. And then um, this is um, very oblate. Um, some scientists argued what kind of uh, candy it would be analogous to uh, this asteroid, Eminem. <laughs> so this one is basically looking really oblate, and then uh, when it comes to the shape, uh, aspect ratio of this asteroid and Eminem are almost consistent. That was a great uh, finding. Unfortunately, uh, the publication didn't discuss anything because that. <laughs> argue in the publication. But um, so we have a lot of large uh, boulders uh, we really don't know why that happened. Uh, there are a lot of hypotheses, but no answers yet. 
The other one, um, this is again the same um, asteroid, Dimorphos. What, one of the um, interesting part is there is a really big shadow, I mean a sunlit region within the shadow. We are considering this region would be a little bit high altitude rather than having like flat. Uh, we don't know exactly what's going on, but um, this uh, one image or multiple images showing the same view gives a lot of insight into it. Um, this is an a impact site, uh, a lot of uh, rocks there. Uh, if you're uh, interested in uh, geolo um, geological or rocks, please contact me. I really want to discuss with you. Um, the idea would be there are so many different cracks going on. And um, you know, um, in terms of distribution, is also interesting. So um, this would give some insight into um, uh, evolution of this asteroid. And then this one is, uh, like I said, uh, the LO, uh, LOS, which is a great indication of um, the success. All right, so um, in terms of the shear cube, uh, it gave wonderful images. So this image was uh, from Luke. Um, it is about uh, three minutes after the impact. And then this is Didymos, and this is Dimorphos. Um, this is ejecta coming through um, because of the dark impact. Um, interesting part is that we have a very clear lineaments. Um, because I'm doing uh, impact physics, we didn't expect this kind of behavior. The reason is, um, we were looking at you know, numerical simulations, and it is very hard to model this type of uh, behavior. Um, our interpretation would be um, sort of like interaction of like multiple big boulders and small uh, particles, so that uh, you can actually see very nice uh, lineaments limit, like that. So um, this is sort of like a multi-scale problem. So if you're looking at dust, and if you're looking at the large boulders, those are interacting each other within uh, this uh, ejecta uh, evolution. Um, this is from uh, HST, um, Hubble Space Telescope. Um, we are monitoring um, H, um, eject, uh, eject evolution through HST, and what we observed were really cool. Um, HST was the one uh, observing the ejected evolution for months. And then uh, what we saw was a really cool evolution. This is just early stage of evolution. And he kept uh, observing it for months to see the tail of the, of the ejecta. Um, this one will be a few uh, hours after the impact. This would be 10 hours, and then this is a half day or day. The idea would be, you can see that evolution of ejecta is really dynamic, right? If you have, uh, I, want, I need to say, this cross, this is a deflection uh, uh, spikes, which is a completely artificial, but when it comes to the, um, I think, which one? Yeah, that, what? Oh yeah, that one. That one and that one, those are uh, ejecta. So um, it is very interesting to see how ejecta evolved. Ah, one more thing. This one is uh, the tail uh, driven by uh, solar radiation pressure. All right, so uh, last one. Um, this is from uh, JWST. Um, JWST also had a lot of cool pictures, and uh, this is one of the images uh, and, uh, given that. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any other slides. The reason was it is currently a live stream, right? So I was trying to give like some results, but um, I decided not to. But <laughs> uh, currently under review, so it is a little bit hard to explain. But um, I want to mention a little bit, um, in terms of uh, orbital period of change, 
that was about the 33 minutes. Okay, so originally we are expecting to have like 72 seconds. Now we identified that orbital period change was about 32 minutes. So we, we had a lot of great um, uh, kinetic deflection through dark impact. Um, also, uh, based on what we observed, um, the beta value was about 3.6, which is also really great value compared to uh, typical ideal uh, beta equals one case. Um, so this mission was very cool. The reason was that um, when it comes to the team itself, we almost had like 1,000 members on the entire team. Uh, starting from uh, the beginning of the design till the end. The, the reason is not only uh, DART itself, we also had a hero mission. We are collaborating to, uh, closely. Um, this was a really great uh, opportunity to experience, you know, like how uh, we interact with other people. Sometimes, you know, we fight. To be honest, um, with the different <laughs> theories, and okay, this is right, this is not right. This kind of discussion happen, but um, when you go out to you know missions, uh, we have a lot of collaborations and work together. That would be great. Um, this is also uh, the story uh, behind the dart. Um, so, um, in terms of the uh, mission itself. Um, um, this is not something from like uh, actual line of mission design. Uh, by this I mean like NASA has a specific route to develop missions, for example, Discovery, uh, Simplex, or New Frontiers, or Flagship. Um, this mission was actually from like different route. The idea was um, uh, there was some idea coming through to test planetary defense uh, several scientists at APL uh, came up with the idea, let's make a spacecraft hit the asteroid, but how we can measure the change of orbit, they came up with to use a binary system rather than a single asteroid. So this was sort of like um, the discussion, not only like an uh, official competitive process, but uh, other process coming through. So like the conversation with a program officer and um, um, uh, scientist going through and they agreed to go through and it came up. So if you talk to program officers, uh, they usually say uh, that was completely on the radar. So like it came up suddenly. The reason is it didn't go through the uh, uh, sort of official process. Um, this is a cool part, right? So like, if you have any like great opportunity, uh, you may have some opportunities like that. Um, you definitely have to compete against them, but uh, other, other uh, teams, but there is some opportunity like that. Um, important part is I uh, officially joined uh, DART mission 2020, uh, 2017, and then um, um, the mission design was already started at that time, and then, um, this is sort of like joke, uh, joke actually, uh, like people are laughing uh, this uh, right now, but at that time it was very serious. Um, so I was proposing some theory uh, in terms of like giving sort of like a potential uh, issue. Uh, this is sort of like purely from dynamics. Um, you know, theoretically, the number is crack. People tested this, and uh, they got the right number. Um, the idea was uh, potentially the spacecraft hit uh, collision would cause you know a large amount of ejecta hitting the um, uh, the primary, which is a Didymos. And then, um, when it comes to dynamics, you need to consider you know GM value, gravity constant. So gravity constant is actually, um, um, well, it doesn't change, but the shape changes gravity. So orbital motion changes by the change of um, um, uh, primary body. I propose that possibly we're going to have reshaping because the asteroid, the primary asteroid, is spinning really fast. If you imagine you have a, um, you know, 
really strong, really high speed ejector hitting the surface of Didymos, you're gonna have a landslide. It changes the shape of Didymos, right? It could change the gravity. So I propose that this could change um, the orbital motion completely on top of the dark impact. And then the idea was, yeah, that's true. And then the key issue was this, how can you resolve this one? Well, at that time, I was really uh, naive. I was addressing, yeah, okay, uh, I definitely ain't gonna consider the solution later. <laughs> <laughs> So, I wasn't on the team at that time, but NASA was considering this particular hypothesis seriously. DART was almost killed by that hypothesis. <laughs> that was something like I really, really like nervous about that when I heard this. But um, eventually I found, or we found the solution. Even if we have a reshaping process on Didymos, we would be able to solve uh, this issue. But um, this kind of a situation happened, and uh, I'm really close to DART. Well, I'm on this uh, Kauai, but at that time, I was a really intense conversation going through, and uh, you know, now I'm here. Um, but <laughs> yeah, so whenever we consider uh, missions, sometimes having really technical issues, and we have to you know, resolve that, um, mission is, you know, sometimes uh, when you have a really too uh, risky or a lot of like strong risks, then, you know, the um, sponsors, I mean, NASA, it would consider seriously and then potentially that would kill. But uh, working together on the team is definitely giving, you know, new solutions. So I learned this from DART. You know, like I was, uh, at that time I was graduate school and then like considering, you know, like working together on the team is giving, you know, new direction, you know. So um, I'm really glad to be part of that mission. And then uh, what I'm feeling right now is I'm proud of it. And then I'd like to create a new mission in the future, but like I want to, you know, use that experience to uh, uh, create, you know, future mission. Um, I think that's it. Um, so thank you so much, and uh, I'll take questions. Question, Micah. Um, so, in terms of this, first of all, uh, we are we have multiple images uh, prior to the impact. The only dark images, uh, group um, Draco images. Those would be uh, uh, key uh, information before the impact. Um, the we're gonna use those images as um, a proxy. I mean, like, we're gonna use this as, you know, a baseline. And um, we also have ground observations. So, for example, like, we have um, information of light curves. We're gonna have uh, some, like, information of colors as well. Um, Ground-based observations have like really low resolution, but we actually saw a lot of interesting features. So uh, they would be able to look at. The other thing is um, there are multiple key investigations on Hera. For example, uh, they're gonna have uh, Juventus and Milani. Those spacecrafts are detached from the main spacecraft to characterize the first internal structure 
as well as um, uh, the surface composition on both Didymos and Dimorphos. And um, we also observe, this is a key important part because I'm doing overall dynamics, by looking at the motion of Dimorphos, we would be able to characterize what kind of feature actually happened before and after DAR impact. So this uh, spacecraft will give additional input to it. And uh, certainly, you know, we can have a lot of unknowns, but uh, having after the DART impact will give us a lot of insight into beta. Does it make sense? Yeah, yeah. is here also a flyby? I guess I thought it was a orbital uh, This is a rendezvous. So it'll, it'll stay there? Yeah, they will, okay, okay, they okay. will stay yeah. like, So it's going to get way more information. Right, yeah. right, right. right. something and I forgot. So, um, <laughs> you got another question. Questions, but. Um, yeah, so you mentioned the diagrams in the geology um, once we were getting really close. Um, so I know that um, there, were, there was the boulder surface. Are there any other like key geologic um, like information we got out of the close approach? Like, oh, okay. Like any accident or anything else that we found interesting in the mission? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And then I remember what I was trying to say. Thank you for the question. Um, so when it comes to um, Dimorphos, uh, we are observing a really nice, uh, um, uh, you know, the shape as well, the distribution of boulder as well. And then um, right now, one of the studies working on would be like, where are craters? So if you look at the, you know, this shape, do you see craters? No, we actually have several. So, um, yeah, <laughs> several. It, it's definitely hard to see, but the geologists look at a three-dimensional shape, and then uh, when you look at some depression, possibly you, okay, so Francis is, is pointing. Yeah, I mean, yes. Okay. Based on the boulders, like some of them are, so possibly uh, this would be a crater. Who would say possibly? We cannot say in exactly this is a crater. Um, also, um, Ryota Nakano, uh, he's sitting there, but um, the idea would be um, we are looking at cracks as well, and possibly those cracks are from uh, thermal fatigues. So this would be very interesting. And if this is true then, this would be the first indication that um, asteroids, particularly stony asteroids, had this evidence. Um, unfortunately, you know, um, we are, not unfortunately, um, this is the exciting part. And then um, Bennu, we had a, some like signatures, and um, this one is a S-type asteroid, and um, uh, if, this is true then. Um, yeah, this would be a first indication of thermal fatigue. Yeah. I was just going to say that next week, uh, Missy F is coming down from North Carolina, and her whole work is studying thermal cracking. That's great. Uh, she thank you. She's going to be prepared for technical engineering. That's so great. Long. Yeah. Looking right. forward to it. Yeah, you should. Yep. One thing I want to mention, uh, because I'm showing this exactly, um, the plot or image. So um, we had nomenclature team to name uh, boulders. For example, like we have uh, this close-up map. Uh, there are multiple boulders are named. Um, so this one is Atabaki. This one is Baran. And one of them, I forgot which one. But the idea would be IAU registered these uh, uh, boulders. This is cool, right? OK. But think this way. When here I go, uh, went, uh, go there, those are gone. Yeah. So, <laughs> we, are, we are arguing why we are naming it. So, <laughs> was this, when it comes to use these images, 
those features, those names are important to indicate which folder are we are discussing. But technically, it doesn't exist anymore. So, uh, <laughs> when what's, it's, what's the size scale here? Oh yeah. So this one is about like from here to here is a twenty meters. So this one is about okay. like less than ten meters, but like. Yeah, seven, eight meters. So if you have a, uh, a spacecraft, this would be um, around this size. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So this is really cr uh, great. It is um, about um, the image was taken 0.5 seconds before the impact. So. Is somebody measuring the aspect ratio of these things? It looks like a lot of them are. Like this. Aspect ratio of this? Yeah. Yeah, like the, I mean, I stare at grains all day. So like, <laughs> the bowl? I, yeah, like the elongate axis, a lot of them seem yeah, to Yeah, that's right. Well, I was thinking that, it, it, can you see linear, like, parallel cracking? Is that what I'm seeing? Especially up in the, like, the top left. It looks like there's a bunch of lines that are roughly parallel. Yeah, that one. So, yeah, we had this conversation a lot. And then... Um, um, oh my god, I forgot the name. Can we talk about this later? Uh, yeah, no, I, I can talk about this for a while. I don't want to push <laughs> Oh my gosh, uh, I'm, I'm Brian now. So, but like, a lot of people argued, so geologists argued, um, what is it, the cone? Francis, do you remember? The impact has a lot of cracks, uh, basically like cone-ish. Oh, like you mean like shadow cone? That's right. A lot of people argue the shadow cone. Yeah. However, shadow cone is developed in a specific impact condition. And can we get that condition on this particular asteroid? That was a questionable. So people argued, but the discussion faded away. But like those are really cool because if you look at this one as well, you can see some cracks, right? So um, definitely the, uh, those are open questions. So if you're really interested, um, let me know. Uh, let's collaborate. So. Bless you. This is really, really cool. Um, so I was wondering, you mentioned a little bit the similarities to um, Jupiter with your entire science mission. I was also wondering, how did this morphology compare to what you saw on like Ryugu and uh, Ikutawa and the other missions with um, the Hayabusa's and the oh, yeah. Thank you for uh, the question. That's the important part. So um, in terms of Bennu and Ryugu, so Bennu is about the 400 meter diameter. Ryugu is about 900 meter diameter. And those are C type and B type asteroids. They are having carbonaceous chondrites, right? So it's pretty much like lighter and it has a lot of like hydrated minerals. This one is S type asteroid. And uh, the idea would be, you know, it's heavier and it doesn't have any water. And then uh, this one uh, is 160 meter uh, diameter, and it's very small, and uh, when it comes to the shape itself, I said interesting, but geomorphologically, it's boring because it doesn't say anything, right? <laughs> However, if you look at, um, going back, that one, this one is uh, Didymos, uh, it is about 100 meter diameter, and then uh, the shape is very oblate, much, much oblate uh, than any other um, asteroids ever uh, observed. So this asteroid is currently um, rotating 2.1 hours. So when it comes to 2.1 hours, basically people are believing if there is no cohesion, or strength, it should be break up because of uh, centrifugal force. So we really don't know what's going on. And then um, if you look at uh, those middle latitude, their material going down to uh, equatorial region. And then you see there is a really nice smooth region there, right? This is we are anticipating. Uh, this is from middle <coughs> latitude, particularly smoother one. 
some of them are actually uh, creating traces because of the uh, boulder rolling down to the equator. So if you look at uh, this one, some like really small like stripes there, right? We are believing or we are hoping to see that those are actually some like traces like that. Um, in terms of Bennu and Rugu, they are uh, rotating uh, four hours and uh, seven hours. Those are way slower than expect, uh, slower than having the centrifugal forces. But this guy is a really, really fast rotator. And uh, yeah, uh, we have really diverse geological features. So. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for addressing that. Yes, this is what I'm uh, uh, hoping to. Yeah. Um, so the reason is if you look at this one, um, unfortunately, we don't have a, a, you know, a whole shape of this one. But uh, if you look at this one from the top, we are actually seeing very circular. We have a shape model of uh, this one from radar. So radar observation can reproduce uh, the shape. And if you look at the equatorial region, it is much, much circular. So when it comes to the formation itself, um, unless there is some force um, going to uh, the radial direction, you cannot get it. Only your or spin-driven uh, deformation or reshape can do it. So um, we are considering this is possibly due to your. Thank you so much, Sushi. Thank you. So now we'll move on to the final part of the event, the presentation of the uh, Astrobiology Certificates by Jen and Francis. I'm just going to stand and cheer. That's usually what I do too. Just going to move Uh, next up, Elizabeth Corbin. 
Aaron. Thank you all again for coming, and thank you all to the, to the fellows and for the speakers. Thanks.